I'm a 20-year-old female, and I live in a very religious state, and grew up in a very religious household. But I myself have never been religious nor spiritual. I'm an atheist, horror enthusiast, and the paranormal has just never been something that scared me, but always something that's interested me. My hood rat friends and I love to go and explore abandoned towns and buildings. I've been doing this since I was 16, and never had any scary encounters other than some rats and raccoons. This past summer, my friend suggested we go visit one of our state's oldest cemeteries that's about 30 minutes up a canyon I live right next to. As we entered the tiny town, and maybe 30 very old houses, he took me down a separate street to show me an old abandoned schoolhouse. Normally, we would get out and go explore, but it was the middle of the day and raining heavily, so we just passed by. There's a plaque on the top of the school that reads 1904 and is surrounded by other very old abandoned cabins. All of the entryways were boarded up, and it appeared that there was no way in. It was an absolutely beautiful building, and I was very intrigued. The next night, I decided to go back up there with another friend of mine. We both get off work super late, so we didn't even end up heading up there until about 1.30am. The drive up the canyon was fine. We listened to music and joked the entire time. But the second we turned onto the road leading us, to this small ghost town, I felt sick to my stomach. I honestly can't even explain the exact feeling that I felt, other than pure terror and dread. I kept trying to write it off as general anxiety from driving so far in the dark. But as we got closer to school, the worse the feeling became. As we approached the building, I nervously suggested that we just drive around and see the building 360. As we did, I looked down at one of the doors that were completely boarded off the night before, and one door was open. Mind you, it had been raining for the past 48 hours. There was no way that someone would have went down there and opened that door. We pulled up down the street of the school next to one of the much older, very abandoned cabins. Reluctantly, I got out the car and locked the door. I thought that maybe I was overreacting and that I just needed to take a Xanax or something and calm down. But when I looked at my friend, I could tell he was very uneasy as well, very out of character for the both of us. We started walking up the street towards the schoolhouse. The feeling in my stomach got worse. And before I knew it, we were standing on the road in front of the schoolhouse. I looked down at my feet, about to step onto the grass. Every single fiber in my body was telling me not to step into the property. I'd never felt this feeling this strong before. I've never been this scared in my life. I wrapped my arm around my friends and forced myself to step onto the grass, even though I knew I shouldn't have. I started to walk around outside the building, just to get a closer look of the outside. We're about 15 steps in, when we come around the side of the building to a ton of trees. We kept walking. Before I could even open my mouth to express how fearful I was, my eyes welled up with tears, and at the same time, we both stopped walking. Neither of us could physically take another step, no matter how hard either of us tried. We both looked at each other, and without saying a single word, bolted back to my car. The ride home, we both came out clean and told each other how scared we were. My friend got really quiet and said, I don't believe in the paranormal, but when we first drove around the school, I looked up and saw this girl staring at me from one of the windows. The scary thing is about how this isn't just the fact that he saw this. There's little to no information about this town whatsoever. 
but the one only thing I found on the school were two separate Facebook posts. One saying, I wanted to go in and explore this building, but as I drove towards it, I got such a bad feeling I had to turn around and leave. And the other, I felt like I was being watched the entire time. I lived across the street. One day I opened my window to find a little girl staring at me from one of the windows in the school. The rest of the night, I was too scared to sleep. I ended up calling my friend back over and we just sat on the couch in my living room and watched Disney films to make us feel better. But in the days passing, I couldn't help but feel like I wasn't alone. I kept having super strange and vivid dreams. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping in my room anymore. Fast forward two weeks. That weekend was my friend's birthday. So we'd been drinking for the past two days at an Airbnb. My liver loves me and I know it. One of my friends and I went back to my house to grab a few things and I had a shower while we were there. He was super tired and still a little intoxicated. And I told him he could lay down on the couch in my room and take a nap while I showered. After I had showered, I got dressed and walked back into my room. And I'll never forget this. My friend, mind you, was half drunk and half asleep, looks up at me and says, who's the guy in your closet? It didn't really register to me at first. So I laughed and replied, there's no one in my closet. He looks at me very seriously and says, no, there's a man standing in your closet. He then woke up fully and explained that he was having a strange dream, but then it clicked. I felt the overwhelming sense of dread flow over me again. I had brought something back with me. I ended up begging my mother to have a priest come bless our home. Again, very out of character for me. And after the blessing, I immediately felt comfortable and happy in my home again. But I think that's more of a mental thing for me, just being raised in a strict religious household, because I'm still definitely not religious. I still don't know what to make of this experience. I don't know what I believe anymore, but I'm convinced that there was something watching over me that night when I went to the schoolhouse, because I had a feeling that if I'd actually have gone in, it would have gotten a lot worse. I am a 31 year old female. This happened when I was about 15 years old. And to this day, I have a thing for big wide eyes. They truly creep me the hell out. When I was 15, I had chores like most teenagers do. One of my chores was to mow the lawn every now and again. I live in Cincinnati. So in the summer, it's extremely humid. On this particular day, I was mowing the grass. I was wearing shorts and a crop top. I mowed the front and that was that. Now at the time I lived off an extremely busy street that ran through my little town. A few weeks later, my mum and dad decided to sell the boat we had sitting in our driveway. I lived in a little town about 35 minutes away from downtown Cincinnati, and it was in Claremont County. So on the day this happened, it was just my mum, my little sister who was six at the time, and myself. My dog was there too, but she was a miniature pincher, so her bark was bigger than her bite. It wasn't her fault. She was only like six pounds, so she tried. So I hear my mum shouting for me, asking if I knew who drove the red truck that had just pulled into our driveway. I told her I didn't. She says maybe he's here about the boat. So her and I are looking out the door window. We had one of those wooden doors, but it had glass at the top so that you could see out directly. And also that means you can see in directly. So we're watching this man and he's not moving. He's just staring straight ahead. 
and begins revving his engine like he's going to ram through our family room bay window. My mum knew something isn't right. She steps outside onto our porch, staying very close to the door and yells, Excuse me, sir, can I help you with anything? Are you interested in the boat for sale? He proceeds to rev his engine louder still. My mum quickly grabs my sister and me and puts us in my bedroom and tells us to lock the doors and to not come out regardless of what she hears. I grab my little dog and am holding the dog and my sister. Then I remember that the sliding office doors are all open and unlocked, only the screen doors are closed. My mum had an extension built on the house as a home office because she was a realtor. So I began to think, with so many open ways, my mum can't do this alone. I opened my bedroom window which leads to the backyard, which we had a huge privacy fence, so I knew that she'd be safe with the open window. And I put my deck chair up against it and tell her to lock the doors and if I'm not back in five minutes to go out the window through the little opening all the way to the other end of our backyard, which leads to the neighbours, and to take the dog with her and call 911. I give her a hug and a smile and told her everything would be okay, and lock the door behind me. When I peek around the corner into the living room, I see my mum pushing on the front door with a shotgun, and this man has his face pressed against the glass with his huge eyes. They're wide and crazy looking, and I instantly freak the hell out. I begin to army crawl through the living room and past the door, so that he can't see me, and so I don't distract my mum. My dad collected stuff from World War I or II, and kept them on the bookshelf by the kitchen and dining room. I grab his bayonet off the bookshelf, and continue to army crawl to the office. I quickly shut and lock all the sliding glass doors, so the only way this man is getting through is the front door. Once I have the office secure, I quickly dial 911, and go over to the door where the man is, and push on the door with my mother, looking at his huge, crazy ass eyes, and yell that I've called the police and they're on their way. At this, he quickly returns to his truck. My mum gets the door secure, and then we hear the revving, only this time it's more aggressive and extreme. We're convinced he's going to ram his truck through our family bay windows. He's getting in before the police come. I hand my mum the phone and go running to my room. I knock to tell my sister to open the door and it takes her a minute but she does manage to unlock it. I knock just as she has begun to climb the chair to the window to run to the back neighbour. Thank goodness I'm quarter in time, because this man didn't ram our bay window. Instead, he took off. But his lips and nose prints remained on our front door on the glass. When the police did arrive, we explained what he was driving and what he looked like. I had gotten his plate number also, and they found him ten minutes up the street at a gold star. It took six policemen to take him down and put him into custody. He claimed to have an epileptic seizure and had no memory of what happened to him. Turns out what really caused this random big eyed psycho to try and break into our house was a few days previously he saw me outside mowing grass and my mum working on the flower bed and thought we were very pretty. I lived in a pretty small area in Clermont County, so I'd seen him around. His family had money, so he got off pretty easily given what he did. Whenever I'd see him, which was mainly where I worked, I had to go to the back and stay there until he left. So to the man whose name I can't put in here and caused me to literally be terrified of big eyes, please, let's never meet again. When I was six or seven years old, when my older brother and sister left state to go stay with our dad, I was too young to join them, so I had to stay in the room my sister and I shared, alone, which creeped me out a bit, as it was a big old farmhouse with a rusty green roof, 
and that room always seemed darker than the others. In the middle of the night, I woke up to something tapping on my sister's bed on the other side of the room. I rolled over and saw a white figure with black eyes sitting on the bed, tapping it, like smacking it with its hands, saying, I know you're awake. I was in shock mode when it stood up, tilted its head before walking over and saying it again. I know you're awake. Like it knew I was looking. I hid under my blankets and closed my eyes as tightly as I could, still hearing the same sentence uttered over and over, until I woke up in the morning and rolled over to face my wall. This white blob orb looking thing flew across my wall and out my bedroom door. I remember thinking it was like a quick flying white possum. Heading out to the kitchen for breakfast, I remember being so proud of my encounter and that I survived it. I don't know why, but I was boasting it to my mum and stepdad. I saw a ghost last night. I've been interested in the paranormal my whole life, and I think this is why. I know I was young, and it could have been my imagination with a mixture of being in the room by myself, but it felt so real. The tapping is just how our bed sounded too. I've also spent hours on the internet looking for some history on the old house, and I can't find a thing. Last year, I was cycling in Tuscany on holiday. I knew the guy who ran it, as it was my coach who also runs a national race team. We're a close-knit bunch on the holiday, as most people know each other from riding together back home. Later in our trip, the coach is talking about something strange that happened to him the night before. I didn't hear him at the time, as I was using the climbs as training and pushing on. We stop for lunch, and he starts talking about his experience, and I ask him what he's talking about. He goes on to explain that he was asleep, and then all of a sudden he starts hearing talking, but just a little bit, as he thinks that it's very weird, as he's alone in that part of the villa, as it's a massive place that's been split into apartments. And he sits up, and then gets pushed back down. In the morning, he calls his wife back home, and she said she'd felt something when she was out there with him earlier that week, like she was being watched. Now on hearing this, I started mocking him, and back at the villa, I carry it on. So two nights later, it's still a topic for jokes. We go to bed, and I crash. Then at 2am, I wake up, and can't sleep. So I just lay there. Then I hear talking and think that it's my mate in the room next door, who I'm sharing the apartment with, just talking to his wife back home in England. So I think nothing of it. About 30 minutes later, I'm tossing and turning, when out of nowhere I feel like my head is being pushed into the pillow, and someone is holding my shoulder down as well. I was freaking out. It stops seconds later, but feels longer. And as it stops, I hear a laugh, and I didn't sleep again that night. I told him in the morning what happened, and he thought I was winding him up. We've since found out that the villa has a history of things happening. Also, his apartment and mine are joined by a door. The rest are completely separate. We're back there again next month. I won't be mocking anyone though, as I don't want karma to take effect. My family owns a country house in rural Missouri that I grew up visiting pretty often. There were plenty of beds and rooms to sleep in, but I always stayed in a room in the basement since it stayed nice and dark well into the day, and the bed in that one was by far the comfiest. Ever since I can remember, I always had a weird feeling when I went down there. 
but I was usually so tired from running around and doing farm work all day that I had no trouble falling asleep. So, it never really bothered me. Stuff started to really pick up around the time I was 12 or 13. The one thing that really sticks out was one night when I was drifting off to sleep. I kept seeing a human-sized shadow walk past my room. This room was at the end of a hallway, and I saw it slowly walk back and forth past my room about three times, almost like it was someone on patrol or something. I always kept the door slightly ajar, and the bright hallway light on because of the creepy vibes. Finally, I saw whoever it was stop in front of my door and wait there for three minutes before moving on. The part that really freaked me out and confused me was that the hallway boards are normally super creaky. Like even my little 12 year old body would make these things pop and crack like crazy. So I knew whoever was walking in the hallway at night couldn't have actually had any weight on them. The other thing that happened that really freaked me out actually caused me to stop sleeping in that room again. I was laying in bed, but this time I had just woken up and was laying with my feet hanging off the end of the bed. When clear as day, I feel a single finger trace a line from the heel of my foot to the tip of my big toe. I even felt the damn fingernail at the tip of the finger. That same day, I went to my grandma and told her everything and that I didn't want to stay in that room and could she please make a bed up for me in an upstairs room. It was then that she told me the family secret. My great grandpa built that house in the early 50s, but in order to do it, they dug up the grave of a Confederate soldier and moved his grave to a new spot 50 yards away. They had a priest bless the new spot and everything, but apparently that wasn't enough for the soldier. The adults in the family kept this from us kids so that we wouldn't get freaked out staying there. There was another time that I had been running around and came inside real quick to use the restroom. I ran through the living room and saw an old man wearing overalls facing a giant bookshelf and looking at all of our family photos. As I ran through the living room towards the bathroom, he just slightly turned his head and smiled at me. My grandpa was also somewhere around the house, so I just assumed it was one of his friends or people working for him and thought nothing of it. I never saw him again after that, but a few years later I was flipping through old family pictures and recognized one of the people. It was the same man I had seen that day wearing the exact same outfit. Jean overalls and a plain white t-shirt with the same sweet smile on his face. I asked my grandma who that was. Turns out it was my great grandpa, the man who had built the house and who died 20 years before I was born. Even though I never saw him after that, I would always come back to the living room to see his favorite old rocking chair rocking back and forth. It never freaked me out because I knew who it was and that he was probably just saying hi and enjoying his old favorite spot in the afterlife. Also, by the time I had told my grandma about all the weird experiences I'd had, and she explained to her that several of the women in my family have a knack for seeing ghosts and stuff, it made me feel better, because I literally see something or have very freaky dreams every time I visit. Things I've also heard and seen include a random little girl watching me while I was sleeping, a young Native American man watching me and saying something I couldn't understand, random objects moving to different places when no one was there, a baby crying when there was no baby around, and just general nuisances from that Confederate soldier in the basement. I think he enjoyed trying to scare me, so I really didn't like him. Out of high school, I worked at a cute little shop that sold gift baskets, goodies, and all sorts of home decor. This was before Big Box Hobby Lobby, and at the time, the store was one of the most popular places to go in town to get cute things for your house, or great gifts for people. The store was actually located in one of the oldest houses in the area. All the stores around there were actually houses at one time, 
and it became this cute, quaint shopping area. For a long time after I started, none of the other workers discussed that the house slash shop was haunted. I don't think they were purposefully keeping it from me, it just didn't come up. The shop slash house was a two-story, with a basement and attic as well. We always stayed open until 7.30pm during the week, and there were always two closers for safety. When closing up, the front doors were locked to prevent any customers from coming in, and you can believe we locked that up on the dot, so that we could clean up, balance the register, and get the heck out of there. There was a back door, but we kept that locked too. Those are the only two ways in and out of the house slash door. On the night something happened to my friend Amanda and I. We were closing and the front door was locked up. We're cleaning, doing our thing as normal. And we're about to go and had walked through the shop top to bottom, turning off all the lights and we're standing at the back door when out of nowhere, we heard the most evil laugh I've ever heard in my entire life. We both freak out, grab each other, and did the thing that you shouldn't do in every horror movie, which is run to the basement. In my defense, that's where the fun was. We ran back upstairs, busted out the back door and called the cops. We called the owners too. They showed up and cleared the place and were more than understanding and indicated they got calls to old houses all the time. The owner's husband shows up, and he was clearly perturbed at us for having called the cops, and said that we should have called him first, and that we're just a bunch of silly girls. However, he then begins to proceed to tell us a story, about how when he was doing book work one evening in the basement, he heard voices upstairs. So he went up to investigate, thinking his wife and daughter had stopped by. He got up, and the voices stopped. So he went back downstairs, and got back to work. He said he then heard them again, and returned to the upstairs part. And this time the conversation continued while he was standing there, and he himself skedaddled out of there. He never did tell us what he overheard specifically. Obviously, the story got out amongst the staff about our experience, and people started talking about theirs. Someone told us they saw jelly jars flying right off the shelf. Another co-worker told us she would be balancing the register, and she could hear furniture upstairs being dragged back and forth, when the shop was totally devoid of customers, and her closing partner was in the back cleaning up. One of the managers told us, that frequently when opening in the morning, she would go upstairs to turn on all the lights and would hear sounds of little girls playing in what would have been one of the house's bedrooms. The husband and wife would get very upset if you referred to what was going on in the house slash shop as a haunting or a ghost. She was a woman of great faith and she would always say that they were her angels. I can honestly say nothing further ever happened to me when I was working there, but it was totally creepy afterwards, especially to turn the lights off upstairs or having to go to the attic and or basement. Follow up to this story, here I am almost 20 years later, and I live across the street from someone who now owns the building and has a different shop in it. The next time I catch her, I'm gonna try and not look crazy and just ask her if she's experienced anything there. This story takes place when I was a boy, very young, with a thirsty desire to travel. My friends and I had banded together all our money to go on a trip through Africa. It was an enlightening experience. And on one of our experiences, we were taking a tour through an abandoned mine town. We were allowed to roam around this town for a little while. And as we were going our separate ways, the tour guide gave us very specific instructions. To stay within the ring. There was an area where we were not permitted to go. And 
We all agreed that we wouldn't go there. However, I was absentmindedly throwing my hat into the air. And my hat was blown by the wind into the area we're not supposed to go in. So, me knowing I wouldn't be in the area for very long, did I scoop past and make my way there to collect my hat? Once I'd already passed this barrier, did I feel confident that I could at least have a peek? There was a small hut where my hat had landed, and I thought for the sake of curiosity that I might as well look inside. I grabbed my hat, put it on my head, and look into this small structure. There were still decaying beds on the floor made from straw and other random assortments of garbage. Nothing worth talking about. I turn around and make my way back across the line. Later that day, my tour guide is finishing up as we are arriving back at the hotel. When one of the women of the tour asks why we weren't allowed to go to that part of the town. He says that there is a curse laid on that town, apparently, and that bad energy and spirits follow those who have stood on the cursed ground, and that even if we don't believe it, it is mostly for our safety. He says this in a jolly tone, one to signify that he doesn't believe it either, and that we should take it with a grain of salt. Most of the tour bus laughs, and the tour ends shortly after. When we arrive back to the hotel, I instantly go to bed forgetting all about the land I stood on that was allegedly cursed. But during the middle of the night, I hear something, footsteps and talking, coming up to the side of my bed, talking in a language I don't understand. And when I open my eyes, there's nothing there. I try going back to sleep. And a few hours later, the talking continues. Is there someone in the room? I turn around, facing the direction where the noise is coming from, and open my eyelids extremely slowly and purposefully. And standing there is a man, or at least a shadow of a man, made entirely of dark mass. I can't conceal my dread. My eyes open wide, and I scream loudly. The shadow, the thing, looks down upon me and then vanishes. I knew at that moment that I had messed up and that I should never have stood on the cursed ground. When we go back to the tour guide for the final leg of our tour, do I tell him what I had done, but don't make it sound as bad as what I actually did. And he told me not to worry and that we would be fine. However, the Shadow Man kept appearing for me every night for the rest of my time in that country. It took about a week, but after a while I finally stopped seeing him. I was very scared that I would be cursed for life, which is something I couldn't deal with. A word of caution to you all. If you are told to not step on cursed ground, don't. The consequences a severely spooky. I was working in London for two weeks, staying in a flat owned by a friend of a friend while he was out of town. About halfway through the job, I got food poisoning and was pretty sick for three days. I still had to work. I got home one night about 12 and was chilling in the front room reading a book before going to bed. When I felt someone else was in the room, I looked up and there was a Native American dude stood in the middle of the room. He was wearing some kind of vest or waistcoat and I see dark lines running up his forearm. He raises a hand, says some stuff directly to me and just vanishes. I wasn't scared, just a bit strange and I went to bed. A few hours later I woke up and wasn't sick anymore. 
and I drew a portrait of him in my sketchbook. A few days later I was back home, sat on some stairs waiting for my girlfriend with the name Little Crow popped up into my head, and I wrote it next to my drawing. About six months later, I hadn't mentioned this experience to many people. The original friend whose flat I stayed in gave me a book of Native American history, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and there was a chapter about a Dakota chief called Little Crow. The photo of him looks like my drawing. He always wore long sleeves because he was shot by his brother when he was younger, and the bullet passed through both his arms. The wounds became infected and left ugly scars that he was embarrassed about. My girlfriend and I have been together for about a year and never had any big problems. We are both pretty relaxed people and have never had a big fight, never had trust issues, the whole shenanigan. So one day I was out in front of my apartment building smoking a cig. This was before we lived together. I had seen her the night before, had a nice dinner and gone out to a bar, then gone to my place after which she took a taxi home. As I'm standing out in front of my apartment building, she pulls up in a taxi. I wasn't expecting her and was pleasantly surprised to see her. I put up my cigarette, smiled, walked up to her and said, Hey, what you doing here? She then scowls at me, slaps me square across the jaw, and I'm dumbfounded and a loss for words. So I kind of just look at her. She never said anything, just barged past me into the building. I follow her up to my apartment, asking her what was happening. The whole way she goes up, she goes into my apartment, and grabs her bag and some of her stuff she left there throws a few things at me, breaking a glass or two, and knocking down a bunch of stuff on a shelf. She calls me a pig, says she knows everything, and that I've broken her heart. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, obviously. And she stops on her way out when I touch her sleeve, glares at me again, and slaps me. She tells me something along the lines of, I hope I never see you again and walks out. I followed her to the street and she got in her cab and drove off. The street was pretty empty and this was about eight or nine a.m. I watch her drive off and at this point, I'm lost for words, scared and sad. Then as I'm watching the cab drive away, someone hugs me from around my waist from behind. I turn around and it's her in running clothes. She was wearing heels and a leather jacket before, and I went completely pale. Hi, she says in her usual happy-go-lucky tone. Then she noticed my look and said, what's wrong? I had spun around, no taxi. It had literally driven away five seconds earlier. No way it could have turned in that time, and all the lights were red. I didn't say anything to her, I just ran upstairs. Her bag was gone, the things were still broken and my door was still wide open. So I told her. We were both momentarily confused. There's no way I could have mixed her up with someone else and she's an only child. We had security check the cameras and sure enough, me following a girl into my apartment. The angles weren't great and the film wasn't great quality, but it was pretty easy to see me in my face, but hers was always hard to make out, and it looked a hell of a lot like her, but never a clear shot. No way it was the same girl. It still creeps me out and I don't really talk about it. We also filed the police report. They came, gathered up the broken stuff, and found only my fingerprints and my girlfriend's on them. Same as with my door and this girl got into the building by herself, which means she knew my door code. Her typing is on the footage. I just hope I never see her again. A little while later, I had a professor from Columbia who's a family friend, and we spoke about this situation hypothetically, and not wanting to sound the fool. 
He teaches something like philosophy and other things to do with superstition and explaining the unexplainable. One of his explanations was very close to this. Somehow, a mirror of our world running a nearly identical timeline folded over ours or collided with ours temporarily. Maybe she saw me at the bar the night before with another girl, my girlfriend, not seeing her face and decided to break up with me the next morning, come to my apartment, and then the amount of a disturbance that resulted in caused our two worlds to break apart right as she drove away. I'm not really one to believe in those things, but after this, I don't consider anything impossible. That also makes me wonder if it's true. How much did I mess up in this mirror world? Things can't possibly be the same there now as she broke up with me. I don't know. It's a lot to think about. This is the first time my girlfriend and I have gone into really thinking about this for a while. And it's scared and shaken me a lot. I moved to Prague in the Czech Republic to work as a private teacher after I figured that the labor situation was far from good in my home country of Belgium for recent graduates. My girlfriend and I are renting an apartment in Hradkanska. That area is fairly close from Prague Castle. It is a duplex located on the last floor of the building, which must be around 80 to 100 years old. However, the apartment where we live has only been inhabited for 20 years, since it used to be the attic of the building. We'd lived there for five months. It's quite modern and bright, nothing to be scared of. However, last month, I offered to keep the dog of one of my students, a lovely young fox terrier, only for three weeks while she was out of the country. I love dogs, but living on the sixth floor without elevators is a deal breaker for owning one permanently. The first night was terrible. The dog couldn't stop whining because it was so used to sleeping in the same bed as its owner, but that isn't too much of a thing, mostly my girlfriend in all honesty. To be able to get some sleep and reassure the dog, I went down and slept on the couch. The dog was silent for the rest of the night, and I woke up in the early hours at around six or seven. That's when I heard what I thought to be my girlfriend walking down the wooden stairs. I heard the cracking of wood and light steps going towards the couch. I was half awoken, but frankly felt that it was too early to show it and start conversation. That's when I felt her sitting on the couch and leaning on me. And when I decided it would be time to turn around and kiss her hello. It's an L-shaped sofa and I was lying on the smaller part. But when I turned around, there was nothing. I listened intently and could hear her upstairs gently snoring. Obviously, I freaked because I have a history of sleep paralysis and I hate it when it happens. And so I thought for the next day that that was it, sleep paralysis. I hate it, but at least I know it's nothing hostile. A few days later, my mum and my cousin came to visit us in Prague and spend Christmas holiday together. They slept on the same sofa, and I was really happy because the dog wouldn't whine anymore as it was not alone downstairs during the night. After their first night, we woke up, and my mum asked who went to the toilet in the early morning. I didn't, neither did my girlfriend, as far as she said. My mum then told me that in the early morning at around six or seven, she heard one of us go to the stairs, walk towards the bathroom which is after the corridor between the couch and the entrance, and stop for a few seconds before the couch. She said she felt like she was being watched, just like I had before, but that it was a bit early to wake up and chat. It's only after we told her about my first experience that she became pale and asked if we were pulling her leg. We weren't. A few days pass, and my mum and cousin return to Belgium. My girlfriend goes to France to celebrate her mother's 50th birthday, and I decided because I did not feel too courageous about being home alone after these experiences, to let the dog come up with me. Two nights ago, 
I was sleeping on my stomach. The dog was by my side, and I again, in the early morning, heard someone either sighing or laughing lightly. I thought it might have been a sleep hallucination, but the dog got up, with its ears all pointy, as if they were trying to hear where the noise was coming from. The dog kept looking in the void towards the direction where I thought the noise had come from a few seconds prior. Now, the dog has returned to its family, and I'm home alone until Saturday. I have never wanted my girlfriend to be back more than now. So my cousin and I thought it would be a good idea to visit a ghost town that was located nearby. We had heard stories from other relatives saying they saw a woman and a daughter in a dress standing or walking by the side of the road. Whenever they'd pass her, their cell phones would either die or completely lose signal. And one of my cousins said his car stopped working as soon as he passed the woman. Seven of us got into a big van and went to the ghost town to see if all the paranormal activity was true. We were talking and laughing in the van, making fun of the people who did get scared of the town and that they were just probably imagining things. None of us had been to a ghost town before and we didn't know when we would reach it. As we crossed a bridge that led to the ghost town, the scenery completely changed. A huge fog appeared out of nowhere and covered the whole town and bridge. The laughter in the van died and it was dead quiet because we knew we had entered the ghost town area. We parked the van on a dirt road that was a little further than the entrance to the ghost town. We turned off the car and closed all the windows and just sat there looking into the dark empty houses. It felt as if the houses were full of ghosts, just looking at the van as if we had invaded their space. The atmosphere was so tense and after five minutes of just sitting there in the dark, the driver of the van suddenly turned the car on and drove out. We all wondered why he'd left so suddenly, and we asked him but we wouldn't answer us. He parked at a nearby gas station, and his face was extremely pale. He finally started talking, and said he saw a little girl walking behind one of the houses, coming towards the van. He was so scared, you could see him trembling. He ran inside the gas station and the cashier saw his pale face and surprisingly, he just asked the driver if we'd just come back from the ghost town. We told the cashier that we did and that our driver supposedly saw a little ghost girl. The cashier told us that he had passed by the town a few times and saw the same thing. He advised us that if we wanted to experience something paranormal, we should wash the car down with those little window wash things that they have at gas stations. We thought this was a good idea, so we all went out and washed the car. We washed the top of the car, the sides, the doors and the windows and all the mirrors, washed all the windows inside the car and we took paper towels and completely dried the car inside and out. We were at the gas station parking lot for a good 10 minutes talking to see if we were going to go back to the ghost town or just go home. We agreed to switch drivers and head back. We went back onto the dirt road and traveled into the center of town. We sat in the van for 15 minutes, just looking out for signs of a girl or signs of activity in the houses. I can't explain how tense the atmosphere was. Seven of us, all age 17 plus in a van, and we had to hold hands. It was weird, but everyone was so scared we couldn't help it. After 20 minutes in the center of the town, I had begun to see a figure in the distance. It seemed like the little girl everyone was talking about, but something was odd. It didn't look like the girl was walking. She was making these odd movements as if she was limping. I told everyone to look into the distance and everyone said they saw her also. We watched and after three to five seconds, the figure looked as if she were getting up. We realized she was crawling and had begun to stand up. Right when she stood up, 
the figure disappeared into the blackness, and a loud bang hit the driver's side. The gravel beneath the van made sounds as if someone was crawling under the car, and three very distinct thumping noises came from under the car. The thumping was directly below my feet, and I could feel something hitting the car. Something also stepped onto the back bumper of the van, and a small thump could be heard hitting the back window. I made the decision that we should leave immediately, and so we did. We got to the gas station, everyone got out of the car, and we all saw it. On the driver's side mirror was a large, fresh handprint. We were all freaked out. I made my way to the back of the car, and there was a little footprint on the back bumper, along with a set of handprints and fingerprints on the back window. But they just wouldn't come off the car. We sat at the gas station for thirty minutes after that, just freaking out, and the prints wouldn't dry. When you touched the prints, they wouldn't feel wet, but they'd look as if they were. Everyone was scared to go back in the van, but we eventually did, and we made sure not to drive the van directly to someone's house, because in our culture, something could have clung onto the van and tried to follow us home. So we went to a nearby Walmart. We stayed in the store for forty-five minutes, came out, the prints were still there. So we had to call someone to get us and left the van in the parking lot until the next day. The prince eventually disappeared, and we took the van back to my cousin's house. We are never going to a ghost town again. Me and my brother are adopted, both from different families at different ages. He was horribly abused before he came to our family, but he was only two, and doesn't remember any of it. But the damage is done. He has explosive anger, and is a compulsive liar. He'll make up stories that supposedly happened in the past. He'll say that our adopted parents continued mistreating him in the same way his real parents did, and that he was never treated fairly, and they only ever tried to buy his love. This is all rubbish, mind you. Our parents are the most gentle and loving people I've ever met. They kept him housed. Fed and dressed all his life. He's twenty-six now. When he was in high school, he used to cut his arms for attention, all superficial wounds, and never had to get stitches. In other words, he's a drama king. We aren't sure if he's bipolar or has some form of autism. He never wants to cooperate with therapists or doctors, so he's never been diagnosed with anything nor medicated. Now let me clarify: we love my brother Duke. My whole family has loved him since the day he joined us. He is quite eccentric, but we've always appreciated him for his differences. Even though he has violent outbursts, we have always just accepted it and moved on. About six months ago, he started dating this woman, Nina. She's ten years older than him and has two children, aged sixteen and ten. Their relationship is a whole different story. But basically, she takes a lot of opioid pain medication, and started to give him some. He has an addictive personality, and is spinning out of control. He took a belt to her son because he was talking back, and he's constantly getting and getting rid of dogs. By no fault of their own, mind you. He says that they're misbehaving, but really they're just reacting to how he is behaving. In June, it's my father's birthday, so one evening we went out to dinner to celebrate. My brother was messed up on some pain medication, and he tried to deny it, but we could tell we aren't stupid. The dinner ended up in a yelling match between Duke and my mother. My mother forced him into the car and drove him to the hospital, but he refused to go in. He probably didn't want his girlfriend to get in trouble for giving him her pain medication. Eventually, she came and collected him, and they went home. 
During the next few weeks, I got a lot of messages from both my older brother and Nina about their fights. Apparently, they think I could help them, but I'm not in the relationship, and I repeatedly explained that to them, that they need to speak to a therapist or marriage counsellor, not me. Their relationship continues to spiral out of control. Nina is apparently trying to get pregnant during this time. Supposedly, she succeeded, but miscarried. Now this could be true, but I'm getting major drama queen vibes from her as well. I really think she's just trying to rock my brother's boat. They go on a road trip, and I get a call from my brother. He's screaming and crying, and telling me that Nina is walking down the highway opposite the traffic, and refuses to get back in the car. I tell him to calm down and beg her to come home. Eventually, she gets back in the car, and they head home and all seems well. About two weeks ago, this stuff starts to show up again. Apparently, Nina is pregnant again, but is threatening to abort the baby because my brother, according to her, does not deserve the baby. I don't know why she got off birth control if she was just going to do that. Duke calls my uncle, tells him that Nina was punching herself in the stomach and that he was furious. He drives his truck into a pole right out in front of the hospital, saying he was trying to end it all. Fortunately, there was a mental health facility right across the parking lot, and he gets voluntarily admitted. But after the 72 hour hold, they release him, and he remains medicated on whatever they prescribed him until the bottles run out, because he lost his insurance after that and didn't deem it necessary to go take the steps to remain medicated. He doesn't stay out for long though. Just a few days after that, he's readmitted, but involuntarily. The details are a bit unclear to me, but the cause was from another fight between himself and Nina. During this day, he is compulsively lying to therapists, not partaking in any activities, and making a fool of himself as well as my entire family. He refuses to see Nina, or take anything she tries to deliver him. My uncle and cousin go on visitation to talk to him. The conversation lasts for about three minutes before he freaks out and leaves. We find out that he has sold all of my grandfather's rifles who passed away ten years ago. My aunt is in agony, knowing that she has lost family heirlooms because of my brother's ill decisions. The next time my uncle goes to visit, he threatens to end my parents' lives, as well as to snap Nina's neck. Present day, my brother is due to be released this afternoon. There's still a point 22 missing. Duke says that he's going to a homeless shelter and getting his dog from Nina. And then goodness knows what's going to happen. Please, pray for us. I grew up in a really old house. It was nearing a hundred years old right before I moved out, and it used to be a post office or something way back in the day. The house is creepy and big. There are three stories, but I was never really scared living up there or anything, although I did like to scare my friends with all kinds of made-up stories, and they always believed me too. The only weird thing that ever happened was when my parents left over a December holiday and I had the house to myself all week. Me and my friend were bored, just sitting outside on the back porch drinking some beers. All of the doors were locked except for the one closest to us. It's just a metal frame door fitted with glass that you can see outside of, but from the outside you only see your own reflection like a one-way mirror. Well, while we're just chilling and talking, someone bangs on the door so hard, I was surprised that the glass didn't shatter. My first thought was that my parents came home early and caught both me and my friend drinking underage. We go into the house and there's nobody, and we looked everywhere. About two days go by and nothing happened. Now my room was covered in posters like most teens. I wake up in the morning, 
and every single one of my posters are taken off the walls and cupboards and are lying neatly folded on my chair. There's no one in the house but me. So either I did it while sleepwalking or it was someone else. To this day I have no idea what happened and nothing weird ever occurred after that. In February 2018, I decided to renovate my kitchen. It was a remnant from the late 80s slash early 90s, chosen by my grandparents as it was their house originally. I couldn't afford a complete refit, so I researched decorating techniques and products that I have gained enough confidence in using in order to tackle the job myself. I'm a fairly anal person organized to the nth degree, so when I removed the cupboard doors, I made sure to put all the screws from each door inside the cupboard I had removed them from, so I had every single screw accounted for. I did my cleaning and decorating, very pleased with the outcome, and eventually, it was time to put the cupboard doors back up. I was alone, and thought I would have no trouble putting the doors back on, since I had been the one to take them down in the first place. I picked up the first door, and glad to see I still had all my screws lined up where I had left them. I struggled to get the door lined up, since I was balanced on step ladders and the hinges which I had left attached to the cupboards for convenience. I decided they wouldn't line up and sit them where they need to go. This struggle made me drop the screw in my hand and I heard it hit the floor. From that height it should have bounced, but I didn't hear that second thud, and it should have made it on the linoleum. There was nothing on the floor to obstruct its fall. I had cleaned everything from that corner of the kitchen, so I could get on the stepladder and put it inside safely. So, there was nowhere for this screw to go. I put the door down and searched everywhere. It wasn't where it should be, which confused me. I searched in the sealed alcove that used to house my undercounter refrigerator, over the floor, even under appliances across from the other side of the room, in case of some miracle that it rolled that far, but I found nothing. Writing it off as yet another strange occurrence, I decided to use another screw from a cupboard I had yet to renovate, thinking that I would buy a replacement at the DIY store later. My work was interrupted by a phone call from my mother, who often calls me on my days off, and after a little chat, she asked me how my decorating was going, since she hadn't seen my efforts for a few days. I told her I was putting the cupboard doors back on, but I lost a screw, and she went a little quiet. She then began telling me how she had just emptied her washing machine that had just finished its cycle. It's a routine for her to put all the clothes the right way out when she pulls them out of the washer, before placing them on the drying rack. And when she put her hand in her sock to pull it the right way out, she pulled a tiny screw out of it. I joked and said my screw had gone to visit her because it definitely wasn't here on my kitchen floor, and even though she couldn't understand how a screw had ended up in her washing machine, especially in a sock she had worn the day before, she said if I could use it, then I should, and she saved me the screw so I didn't have to go to the shop to get one. I wasn't convinced it would be a useful screw, but agreed so she came to visit as she only lives two streets away, and when she put the screw in my hand, my gut turned over and the colour drained from my face. It was the same size, with the same amount of rust, and I triple checked to make sure I had every other screw, and I did, and nothing could explain how a fairly specialised size of screw could end up in my mother's sock in her washing machine. There was only one explanation. It was my screw. This happened to my cousin. This was years ago, but we have a family home in the province of the Philippines 
and we refer to it as the White House, because there are supposed to be ghosts there. In Filipino culture, ghosts are all white. If they're another colour, they're demons. I don't completely remember why we were there, but I remember it was time to eat dinner. So our uncle told my cousin to wake up his mum who was sleeping downstairs. My cousin, Jared, didn't want to go up there because he knew that's where the ghosts were. So my uncle said, it's up to you, your mum won't be able to eat them. So Jared got really worried that his mother wouldn't be able to eat dinner. So he went up the rickety old staircase and entered the first three rooms. He saw his mum sleeping under the blanket. So he went to shake her awake. Before he could put his hands on the blanket, he heard a voice call out, Jared? He quickly turned and saw his mum standing in the doorway. When he looked back at the bed, the blanket was laying completely flat. I live in an old house that was converted into a triplex. All of the doors in my apartment push themselves open randomly, and any toiletries left on shelves in the shower are thrown to the floor. The first year or so living there, it scared me each time it happened. For example, I would be laying in my bed, and the door, which would be fully closed, would push open. Nobody else was home. I'd freak out and check everywhere for an intruder. Or I would be in the living room and would hear a big commotion from the bathroom. I'd go look, and my shampoo and conditioner and body wash would be on the floor. Again, there's no one else to mess with stuff, and my boyfriend would complain to me about the same stuff happening while he was home alone. I half expected all my cupboard doors to fly open at once, and the kitchen chairs to flip upside down one day. To make matters worse, my boyfriend's son went through a night terror stage during that first year. I was chatting about it with my friend, and telling her how we tried everything to help him stop having the terrors. She told me not to think she was crazy, but wondered if there was a possibility it could be something paranormal. She didn't know about the other stuff, so her saying that gave me goosebumps. I hadn't considered it before, but putting it all together scared me. We've been living here for five years now, he grew out of the night terrors, and I'm pretty sure all of the weird things that happened are due to pressure and temperature changes, but for good measure, I say hello to the ghost when a door opens on its own. When I was 18, I worked at my uncle's gas station. On Fridays I would do the overnight shift. The story starts off with me by myself in the gas station. It's the middle of winter, and it's about 2 a.m. Winter season is extremely slow. I haven't had a single customer in over an hour. I start to clean the store and make some coffee when a customer stops at the pump. The guy gets out. It's a short Italian guy wearing one of those Puma tracksuits with a wife beater under it and sporting some bling around his neck. He was driving a dirty old little car. I have no idea what type it is. And I just say to the man, how's it going? What can I get you? This is New Jersey, so I have to pump the gas. The guy reaches into his back right pocket and pulls out a money clip with all $20 bills in it. He looks at the price, then down at his money and begins to count. I say again to the man, what's it gonna be? He looks up at the price, down at his money and finally says, I'll have 22 bucks of the regular. While I was putting the nozzle into his car, I thought to myself, that's weird, $22? He clearly had plenty of money to make it even, but in the end, why should I care? So, as the car was getting its $22 worth of gas, I followed the man into the store. I stop at the doorway just to keep an eye on him, and he goes directly to the cold drinks stops and stares at the first cooler in front of him. Then he looks to his right, then looks to his left, then turns around and walks out to his car. I was like, okay, weird, 
but by now the gas is done. And I walk up to his car, and then the man asks, How much do I owe you? I look at him with a confused face and say, 22 man. He says okay, and gives me two $20 bills. I give him his change, and then he goes on his way. Not two minutes go by, and I get another customer. It's an Indian guy driving a really nice SUV Porsche, and he's wearing some really nice looking clothes. I meet him in his car at one of the pumps. As he's getting out, I greet him and ask him what he wants. Now in this moment, I had that sense of deja vu overcome me. Because he started doing everything exactly the same as the Italian guy did. When I asked what he wanted, he simply reached into his back right pocket and pulls out a money clip with all $20 bills. He looks at the price, down at his money, and I asked again, but already knew the answer. He looks at the price, then his money again and says, I'll have $22 of the regular. Now at this point, I'm kind of freaking out. It feels like an episode from the Twilight Zone. The guy walks into the store, goes directly to the cold drinks, does the same thing as the Italian guy did. Looks right, looks left, turns around and walks to his car. I'm thinking to myself, is this really happening? By now the gas is done. I rack up the nozzle and the Indian guy asks, how much do I owe you? I say with a gasp, 22 bucks. The desert is a scary place for me now. It used to be a place filled with peace and serenity. But since living out there for almost 30 years, you see things. This occurrence took place in the high desert of California in the mid 90s. The whole town was once all military. There is a military plant there and a prison. The streets to this day consists of numbers and letters, for example, Avenue O and 178th Street. You always heard stories of people missing and underground tunnels. In fact, a friend of mine kept getting a draft coming in from his closet in his childhood home. After he grew up, he checked it out and found an opening to one of these such tunnels. He called me over to check it out but after I got there, and we went through the opening, I was too freaked out to go more than 10 feet in. When I turned around and told him, this might be how people disappear. You always saw things late at night off in the distance, far past the lights of the small town. Strange glowing lights that shot straight up, and things in the sky that you never spoke about. Life was pretty carefree back then. If you wanted to visit though, you would have to drive down long desert roads and sometimes end up coming home late at night in the pitch black because there were no street lights. I remember coming home late one night with my boyfriend at the time and another friend and we pulled over for some reason. Something compelled me to get out of the car and look to the stars. We were in the middle of nowhere but we could hear what sounded like machinery and muffled clanks from metal. We all started looking around, but didn't see anything. Just then, we felt a vibration under our feet. I crouched down on the street and put my ear to the ground. It was coming from under us. We all listened intently and heard far down voices, but couldn't make out what was being said. We all stood up and were discussing what it might have been when we saw a small red light on the horizon that was getting closer. We piled into the car and got out of there. We only shared this with a few friends and they had experienced the same thing. A year later, I told a friend that I had started a small business hauling, but there was a big job so I needed to borrow a trailer. He said he had a few so I could use one and that I should go back to his property to check it out. It was just starting to get dark when he pulled out his new toy. 
It was military-grade night vision binoculars. He told me to wait until it got dark to leave, because he wanted to show me something creepy. I was all in. Later, we walked towards the back of his property, looking out at nothing. No lights, no roads, nothing but the barren desert. He pointed the binoculars east, and oh my, there were people out there coming out of the ground and moving around. What the hell am I looking at? He told me his family called them ground dwellers, and they're located in various parts of the desert. It gave me the heebie-jeebies, and needless to say, I never went to his house after dark again. At one point, we were living in a mobile home park past Avenue F. There was a huge tree in my yard left by the former renter. The only way to get up into it was a hole that was cut into the floor with a door on it. Under that was a rope ladder. One night I was sitting on the porch drinking a cup of tea when I heard something move up in the treehouse and then a head popped up. It was a lady and her husband hiding. Clearly, I thought they were on drugs. I told them to come down from there, but they didn't want to. It wasn't until I threatened to call the authorities did they cautiously comply, looking all around, not wanting to be seen. By now, there's a small group of my friends and nosy neighbors gathering around, and I saw that she was terrified by something, so I asked them to come in. I made them something to eat and waited for her to calm down. She pulled out these papers. They were drawings and schematics. They looked like legal documents with government letterhead. Some of them had embossed seals and had smoke damage, even a few burnt around the edges. She told me that they were checking out this place off Barrel Springs Road. There were two or three cinder block structures there. I knew them well. A few years back, I happened upon that place, and a black truck rushed down to greet me with guns drawn. She said the same thing happened to her, but she was in one of the structures, so she grabbed some of the things and her and her husband ran. I went over these pages and felt very uneasy reading them. Like, this was stuff people get killed over if you got out. Stupidly, I said, why don't you just give them back? She said they had been running, and everywhere they went, they saw a black car or van with government places showing up, just sitting there watching them. Well, I really didn't want to get too involved, especially after reading what I did. It wasn't too big for me, and I will take what I saw to the grave. So I packed them a lunch and told them they could sleep in the treehouse for the night. They did, but were gone early next morning. After that, we started seeing black vans parked on our lonely road facing the house. At one point, I even went up to one of them, but they took off as soon as I knocked on their blacked out driver's window. Lots of unexplained things happened out there in the desert. You don't see much of it now, I think because there are more lights and people, well-lit towns and camera phones pointing in every direction. There weren't cell phones to call for help back then. I remember one time a few years later. It was a fun day. Some friends and I were in this stupid little red car called a Yugo that seemed to be on its last legs most of the time. This is where my friend's uncle told him that there was a whole abandoned town far west of the Mugavi Desert and that there were things just left there all over the place. We were so dumb. It took us a long time to get out there, and if you ask me to try and find it now, I don't know if I could. I wasn't driving, not that I would ever want to. Thinking we were lost a few times, we started seeing things. A carnival ticket booth on a trailer, broken tractors and furniture, little shacks here and there, and empty water bottles everywhere. There wasn't a store or place of business for many, many miles. I wondered how anyone could even survive in a place like this. And that's when we saw it. It was long and looked like a single wide mobile home. If you could even call it a home. It was between 60 to 80 feet long. And it was raised with the siding 
going all the way to the ground. It looked like something from a horror movie. It had windows lined all the way around the front of the house, with old frayed curtains still hanging up and blowing in the desert breeze. There were open sections of missing siding, exposing the darkness under the house. There were dusty cars with their front doors and trunks open, open cans and trash all over the place, and a small fire pit in the middle of all of this. His girlfriend and I saw people that seemed to not be wearing any clothes, but their bodies weren't like ours. They were inside that house and were watching us from the windows and from the open spaces under the house. They were following us and we were driving the length of the house. As we slowly drove past, they went from window to window and space under the house to space. They were almost inhuman. They had big eyes and pale skin, far too pale for the desert. He pulled up next to the fire pit, and despite our protests to go, he turned off the car, and his girlfriend began to cry out that we had to leave now. He didn't see what we saw. Stop, babe, this stuff's cool, he said. Oh my gosh. I wanted to punch him in the face. We both kept looking at the people watching us, while begging him to get back into the car. He picked up a long bone, and was moving the soot around the fire pit. Hey, looks like someone cooked a dog. Just then, he looked up at his girlfriend, leaned over to the driver's seat, and grabbed his jacket, and started to pull. And he finally saw what we were seeing, and we said, Oh shit. The thing under the house was swaying back and forth, with his hands on both sides of the opening of the siding. He was staring at us almost with intent to lunge. He tried to start the car, but it failed. Thinking that this was the end, eaten in the desert, I started to beat on the back of his seat, screaming to start the car, and after three tries, we tore out of there in a cloud of dust. We pulled over far from that location and tried to compose ourselves. Never, ever would we return. I don't think ghost towns from this point on were a good idea. We didn't talk about what we saw after that. I think we were in disbelief that it even happened. There were so many things that occurred in the desert back in the day. Too many to even come close to tell you. But I do believe that there are things we do not, and maybe will never, understand there. Also, just a tidbit of information. Rosmond way back in the day was a toxic dump site. That's why the houses were so cheap. You ask anyone now, and they won't know what you're talking about. I had a long-time employee we called MacGyver, because he had such a knack for fixing or improving anything with whatever he had on hand. An example is a storage cabinet that had the handle broken years ago. Instead of fixing the lock, he strategically placed a magnet that holds it closed, and it's still there today. He died of cancer in 2010. And just a few days after he passed, I accidentally broke a shelf off the wall. I tried rehanging it with no luck. It had broken, and the screws that anchored it were missing. I threw the shelf in the garbage, but not before saying I wish Chris was still here, because he would have figured it out. I have the only keys to the office, and am the first in and last out. The next morning when I came in, the shelf was out of the trash and rehung. Push pins were used to both hang it and stabilize it. Exactly the type of fix that he would have done. To this day, I have no explanation for how that happened. Chris is a Christian, raised through and through. He's not one of those forceful Bible bashers, but get him on the topic of religion and he'll talk your ear off for hours on end. He believes that the Judgment Day is coming soon. 
in his lifetime, as most Christians do, and how anything that goes against the Christian faith is demonic and therefore evil. He is also a believer in a lot of conspiracy theories, from how the UN is a front from sending money to terrorists in the Middle East, to how global warming is caused by Russian submarines detonating bombs under the Arctic ice, to aliens and alien abduction. But alternatively, I'm an atheist, and don't go for any of that nonsense. No matter how many ancient alien documentaries or Bible passages he quotes as proof of his claims to the truth, although I am a firm believer in ghosts because I've seen them ever since I was a child. Despite our differences in beliefs, we've been good friends for almost 20 years, due to the fact that we respect each other's views and never let our discussions on religion and the paranormal get out of hand to the point of raining blows down on each other. The night that this happened played out just like any other night. He had dinner, spent some time playing music in his stack of vintage cassettes, and scolding one of his cats, Bingo, for knocking down some of the World War II model planes that he builds for a hobby. It was around 10.30pm, which according to Chris was late, and he decided to call it a night. He was awoken maybe an hour later to hearing scratching sounds at his bedroom door, so thinking it was one of his cats, he goes to open it, expecting one of his furry companions to come sauntering in. There was no one. Thinking nothing much of it, he closed the door and went back to bed, and just as he was throwing the doona back over himself, he heard the scratching again. Getting up again, the scratching stopped as soon as he opened the door. Being a little annoyed, he stepped out into the hallway and flicked on the light, wondering if it were his cats playing in the hallway and that they ran off when they heard the door opening. But the hallway was empty. He checked the bathroom thinking they may be hiding there, but found it empty. He looked in the kitchen and saw nothing there either. Chris, confused, but too tired to give it any more thought, went back to bed, but left the bedroom door open a crack so that he wouldn't have to get up again, in order for his cats to just let themselves in. He was falling asleep again, and then he felt the mattress near his feet sag, as though someone was sitting on it. Figuring it was one of his cats, he said goodnight to his little furry sleeping companion, before he could drift off to sleep. That's when he felt his hair being stroked, and a soft woman's voice whispering, My friend opened his eyes and saw the figure of an older woman, mid-70s to early 80s, leaning over him in bed, smiling down over him, her hand moving rhythmically in a slow stroking motion over his hair. He let out a slew of curse words, leapt from the bed, grabbed his pillow and spent the rest of the night sleeping in the tub. Chris called me the next afternoon to confirm our plans over the weekend. I had first thought when he told me about the events of the previous night, with nervousness in his voice, that he sounded like he wasn't sure if it had really happened or not, or had just had a bad dream, and his brain hadn't processed that he was awake. Chris was just starting to describe what the woman looked like to me over the phone. When I stopped him and suddenly asked, did she look like an older lady with short black hair, kind of slightly old and hunched over? He was genuinely surprised, exclaiming in an almost unbelievable voice, Yes, how did you know that? I've seen her at your house numerous times now, but I've never said anything to you because I didn't want to scare you. There was a long silence on his end of the line, like he was trying to process what I just revealed to him. Chris's voice finally came back, shaking and asked me, Are you serious? It was now that I wanted to say that it was just a joke, because I know how nervous Chris can get when it comes to talk of ghosts and anything that doesn't conform to his beliefs. But I decided to just be honest with him. I figured it would be easier for him to accept his first ghostly encounter instead of lying to him. I told him yes, that I'd seen her on occasions where I was over at his house, but I told him that she wasn't a bad spirit, and that I didn't get any ill vibes from her whenever I saw her, 
or felt she meant harm. Not surprisingly, this didn't make Chris feel any better and he kept bombarding me with questions like what she was doing there, how long she had been around and what she wanted. And I told him that she just probably enjoyed being in the house that she used to live in when she was alive and keep watching over it. I told him that I didn't really feel like she was going to go or poltergeist in the house and that she was just curious about her new roommate and not to worry about her. But Chris, being opposed to all things supernatural and believing anything like ghosts go against the Bible, didn't believe me and said he would have a talk with his minister from his local church to see about getting his house blessed. I assured him it wasn't necessary, but I could see his point of view on such a thing. I mean, after not believing in ghosts all his life, only to be confronted by one would be the same as me being an atheist, suddenly having the existence of God proven to me. So Chris and his church minister held a short service at his house, whereby at the end, Chris was told that the old woman had found peace throughout their prayers and was able to move on. I visited Chris's house a week after the blessing, where after some time of hanging out and having him show me his latest model airplane, did he ask me, do you know if that old woman's still here? I shook my head and said, nope, can't see her anymore, even though she was standing in the doorway between the hallway and the lounge room. I figure there's no sense making the poor guy worry over something he cannot control. After a shower, I walked towards my room with the door half open like I left it, but was frozen in fear as I heard footsteps and the sound of paper scrunching loudly in my room. There was even a huge shadow being cast from my room's alien lamp on the hallway floor. My first thought was, what's my dad doing in my room? Then I heard his voice laughing and chatting with friends and family in the lounge slash kitchen. My next thought was, I hope everyone in the house isn't in the lounge slash kitchen. I silently walk into the lounge room and could see everyone in the house was there and the kitchen casually chatting. My heart skipped a beat later at night. I went back to my room and noticed everything was in its place. Nothing seemed to have been touched and the rest of the night was normal. I was 10 at the time, but was too scared to go into my room during that occurrence. That was over a decade ago, but I know 100% what I saw and heard, and it definitely wasn't a pet. We don't have any of them, and the footstep sounds were too loud to be something like a dog. It sounded like my dad's heavy footsteps. I know it can be explained by something rationally, but it still gives me the chills whenever I think about it to this day. I've had a few moments that I feel fit the mold of a glitch in the matrix. The first really big instance I can remember began so innocently. My then fiance and I were watching something on Netflix, probably The Office, when she got up to get a drink of water we lived in a studio that was very well arranged for the square footage. The kitchen had a bar separating it from the rest of the living room and a wall at the end of the bar that prevented you from seeing into the kitchen from where the couch was located. The bedroom didn't have a door, but it did have an entryway instead of just being open. My fiance calls my name rather loudly for how close I am to the kitchen from my spot on the couch. She comes around the wall from the end of the bar with that giant nervous smile she always got when she was seriously freaked out. What's wrong, babe? I ask. Just come here. This is gonna sound stupid, she says. She pulls me up from the couch and I follow her around the corner to the kitchen and up to the sink where she is pointing. Did we have one of those before? She says, pointing to a sprayer on our kitchen sink. A sprayer which definitely we did not have. It didn't even exist before she'd pointed it out. I feel myself go white, which may sound silly given that there was no danger. 
but I will tell you it was a very uncomfortable thought to know that something could just materialize like that. I pulled the sprayer out and tested it to see if it worked, and it did. I looked at Sandy and said flatly, nope, it wasn't. I remember there being a little circular metal cover where one should be installed. And I'm pretty sure I asked the landlord if the sink had one when I saw the muddled unit. And he told me that it did not, but that he could have installed one if I wanted it. But he said that we could have one installed if we wanted it. I am sure I said something along those lines, but with a lot more stumbling around as my thoughts were dumbfounded. I should also mention, no one had been to do any work on the sink at this point. Our garbage disposal broke a few months later, but there was no point at which a sprayer could have been installed. Sandy couldn't talk, and she began to panic. I sat down on the couch with her and turned on the show, so that she could have something else to think about while we tried to figure out another way to prove that we were both just completely spaced out and that the nozzle existed. It took me about 10 minutes to remember that I had taken pictures of the apartment the day we moved in, documenting any damage so that we would not be responsible when moving out. Surely there must be pictures of the sink there, I thought. I flipped through my gallery until I came to the first of the 20 or so pictures of our studio apartment. About halfway through where the pictures of the kitchen should have been, five or six of the images had been corrupted and were just blank. No other pictures in my entire gallery had been corrupted, just the ones that should have shown our kitchen, and more importantly, the sink. I felt the color drain from my face even more, if that were possible. I explained to Sandy what I found and she didn't believe me until I handed her my phone. That probably wasn't the best idea, because I spent the rest of my night comforting her. I will say that around four hours later, she randomly said, Oh, I remember using the sprayer, and promptly stopped being freaked out. My honest opinion, given how stable my now ex-fiancé was, is that she could not handle the idea something so bizarre could happen and fabricated a memory to ease her mind. That would not be the first nor last time she invented something happening to make her life a little easier. On another occasion, I was out driving with the same ex in the passenger seat. She had this thing where she liked to count how many dogs she saw in a day, which was admittedly pretty cute. Well, we saw this guy walking his dog the dog was on a leash. We didn't get a good look as we were driving by at a decent pace. And as we passed the man, he passed behind a telephone pole just before an underpass. As he emerged from the other side of the pole, we both saw there was no dog with him as he came into view. There was a small wall alongside where the man was walking. And for the dog to have gone anywhere, he would have had to have run directly into traffic. Not only that, but the man just continued walking with no leash and no dog, and no panic of an owner or dog walker just having lost hold of their leash. We looked at each other wide-eyed, and I asked her if she saw the dog, and she said she did, as she was just about to count it as it was the first dog she'd seen that day. She described the exact same thing I witnessed, that when the man crossed behind the telephone pole, the dog went behind him, but didn't come out the other side. I'm sure everyone listening to this is aware of how hard it would be to miss a dog crossing behind a telephone pole. Even if it turned to line up with the pole, and why would it do that anyway? Anyway, I found it very disconcerting. My old neighbors were moving out and paid me 50 pounds a month to keep their old house clean and locked up while they were trying to sell it. One day a random couple from a few doors down 
came to my house to tell me that they had seen someone inside the house and wondered if it was me. I grabbed my torch and me and my dad ran over to the house thinking that some squatters had thought they'd hit the jackpot. But when I went in, the place was completely empty. I checked every single room and cupboard inside the house and couldn't find a soul. So I brushed it off and thought it must have been the owner's daughter or something that she'd left before the couple came to mine. I spoke with the couple a few days later and told me that they were absolutely 100% certain that they saw the bedroom light turn on and saw two children playing in the room. I told them that it must have been the owner's daughter, that she has two children, and they told me that they had spoken with her and she hadn't been to the house all week. I laughed it off, thinking that the couple must have been seeing things. But ever since that day, I've had a very weird feeling come over me every time I walk into the house. It's sold now though, so the ghost kids are no longer my problem. When I was 14, my family and some of our friends went to the Myrtle Plantation in St. Francisville. That was a terrifying experience. When we got there, I felt like this shroud engulfed me. Before our tour, we were walking around and I heard, where's Cornelia? And just thought it was my mum's friend asking about her kid. And maybe I heard her wrong. Her kid's name was Cameron, but when I asked her husband where she was, he said she went to the bathroom inside. When the tour began, I kept feeling distracted like I was dreaming. I was barely listening until our tour guide told us about the owners and the slaves that killed her master's family by accident. Chloe wanted to give her mistress and her children food poisoning and accidentally killed them. One of their children's names was Cornelia, and they were buried where I had heard the voice. I had to ask the tour guide twice before I could believe it. Then towards the end of the tour, we were taken to the trees in front of the house where they hung slaves. I remember walking to the tree line and suddenly feeling as if no one was with me. And I saw flashes of people hanging there and I heard weeping. I almost passed out and told my mum I needed to sit down, so she walked with me to a bench near the house. When she asked me what was wrong, I told her and began to cry. That evening we all went to this Mexican restaurant. I couldn't eat because the food was making my mouth hurt like I had an ulcer, and I went to the restroom to find two sores in my mouth. Then that night at the hotel room, I woke up to the feeling of someone watching me, and I see this black shadow figure near the foot of the bed. I had to turn on the bathroom light just to go back to sleep. After the tour, they allow you to go around and take pictures of the outside of the house. The only photos they allow of the inside are of this mirror that supposedly the souls of the mistress and her children are stuck in. My mum took a ton of pictures on the outside and we didn't look through them until we got home. We actually captured something in the photo. My mum didn't notice it, but when I looked, I found her, Chloe, the slave that accidentally killed her mistress and the children. She was standing behind my mum in the picture. My mum had taken a close photo of the window trying to get a photo of the inside of the house and you can clearly see my mum's reflection. And then standing behind her, a figure wearing a turban on her head and period clothing. She had no face. My mum had taken four photos of the window. In the first, you can see my brother standing behind my mum and the chairs on the porch. The second is the same. The third is the one with her standing behind my mum. And the fourth is the same as the first two. It freaked me the hell out. My mum also took a few of the mirror as well. In the reflection, you can see all of us, my sister and her friends up front, both with white shirts. But in the reflection, there are also three black orbs. 
You can see them clearly because of my sister and her friend's shirts. A large orb and two smaller ones. For weeks, I felt like I've been watched by something. Even when I talk about it now, I'm feeling like I'm reliving it. That strange, dreamlike feeling, and my throat is closing up. The Myrtle Plantation is one of the most haunted in Louisiana. I visited a number of them, but have never felt as scared as I have there. I am a country girl. I don't live on a farm, just a half acre parcel with my husband and our only son. We have two horses, two cows, two pigs, so my morning is spent doing chores both inside and outside. Our only son Michael is five, and since he is an only child, we decided to host a foreign exchange student for a year. We chose a girl from Denmark that enjoys riding horses called Margie. She was with us for about a month when we decided to take her to Olvera Street in Los Angeles. Olvera Street is a huge outdoor swap and meat like setup where you can get anything from hand blown glass pipes to the best tacos, albeit the greasiest I've ever had. We arrived and I couldn't believe the traffic and crowds. It was kind of intimidating at first, but as we drove into a parking lot that you had to pay for, I felt better knowing that there was someone to watch the cars and we walked the short distance to Olvera Street. Right outside the entrance, there were Native American dancers performing, and we were all caught up in their performance, and even joined in the dancing. Olvera Street was absolutely overwhelming, and there was stuff everywhere, and the crowds were scary, as I worried that my son would get lost. I had never seen crowds like this, and had never been in one either. We spent the day shopping and eating the most delicious Mexican food. It was at this point I realized that Taco Bell was not Mexican food. And by the time we exited Olvera Street, it was beginning to get dark. We were absolutely exhausted and walking the short distance to the car. As we approached the parking lot, it was comforting to see that there was still an attendant, so I had no fear nor worries. As we entered the lot, I was absent-mindedly going through the pictures I had taken that day. I had my huge purse, the bag of things that we bought, and my very expensive camera. Michael and Margie were dragging several steps behind us, and my husband kept inching his way closer to me. He got right in my ear and whispered in a very alarming tone, Lock the doors when you get in. I understood the words, but the alarm in his voice made me look up to see five or six big guys slowly approaching our direction. All of a sudden it dawned on me what was going on. So I told the kids at least three times to lock the doors when they entered. I was trusting a five-year-old and 15-year-old whose native tongue wasn't English to understand to do what I said. As we started to get into the vehicle, the guys quickened their approach. And as I slammed my door, one guy grabbed the door handle and began tugging it aggressively. Luckily, I had instantly locked the doors as I closed it, and looked back to see that both Michael and Margie had locked theirs, as one guy on each door tried in vain to open them. As my husband started the engine, the guys kept saying that we needed to pay for parking in the lot, and we told them we already did, to no avail. We backed the car up slowly, as to not run over the six guys that surrounded us, and we inched backwards. They all kept pounding on the car saying we needed to pay, and we had backed up far enough and began going forward, only to see four guys blocking the exit. Now my husband is perfectly calm, just inching towards the exit with the guys, who were getting even more aggressive, pounding on the car and saying we needed to pay. Inching slowly more and more and more, we reached it. Now these guys had no intention of letting us leave without paying, but my husband being the calming force that is going to get us out of this safely, inched past their backliner sized men blocking the exit, and he finally turns onto a street. We thought we were safe, 
and we will run. My husband safely got us out of the parking lot but inadvertently pulled onto a one-way street going the wrong way. We had six lanes of cars ahead of us and we had no way out. He started going forward and the cars are getting closer and closer and at the very last moment he pulls into the parking lot of a liquor store and that's where he stops the car to take a breath. My heart was absolutely pounding and the poor sheltered little soul was still in that parking lot, so proud of the kids who did exactly what they were told and staying calm in the face of danger, and so thankful to my calm-headed husband, who was the superhero that day and every day for me. I will never go to LA again now, not even for free tickets for my favorite band. I'm still very much a country girl, and I'm afraid that big cities are simply not for me. This happened to my mum, sister and me many years ago. I was around eight and I'm 37 now. My sister is five years younger. Back then we lived in a city in the UK, in a not so nice part of town. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't the ghetto or the wild west, but there were much nicer places to live. My dad was self-employed and owned a small factory in the outskirts of the city centre about five miles from our home. His factory was surrounded by wasteland, mostly derelict homes and dilapidated buildings. This was all he and his business partner could afford at the time, you see. The area was grey, dirty, covered in graffiti. Hell, not even the city homeless would take refuge in the decaying buildings after dark. One day, my dad called my mum at home. He needed her to come to the factory to help him finish a job. Back then, they only had one car, so it meant us getting on the bus. I didn't mind. My eight-year-old self was full of adventure and loved the idea of riding the bus to Big Town. The bus ride was uneventful and we braved the city traffic, eventually arriving at our stop. As described earlier, it's not the type of place people go unless they have a specific reason to go there, so it wasn't surprising we were the only ones to get off at that particular stop. We started in the direction of my dad's factory, which was just under a mile from the bus stop. My sister was asleep on her pushchair, and I was jabbering away as only an eight-year-old can. When I suddenly became aware, my mom was preoccupied. I looked at her, but she told us to keep walking in a hushed voice. I noticed she kept glancing over her shoulder. I slowed down to take a look, but she tugged my arm and told me to carry on going. I remember feeling anxious as my mom walked faster the pushchair bumping over the uneven paving slabs and my legs struggling to keep rhythm. Then I heard him. First the footsteps, clumsy and heavy, then his low rasping voice. He was muttering incoherently, having a conversation with himself. Suddenly my mum crossed the road, holding my arm tightly while steering the pushchair with one hand. He crossed the road too. My mum cursed under her breath, and after a minute or so, we crossed back again. Whenever you think you're being followed, there's always the nagging doubt you are just being paranoid. So when we crossed the same road for a fourth time in five minutes, with creepy McCreepy person still hot on our tails, still muttering the occasional shout, we knew full well this guy was following us. This was back in the late 80s, so no mobile phones, no internet, and no text messaging. You really were off the grid. By now, I could feel the adrenaline radiating from my mum. We were approaching a T-junction, and my dad's factory was around the corner to the left, about 400 yards down the road. If you didn't know where it was, you would assume we were heading further into the concrete ghost town. As we turned the corner, my mum told me to run as fast as I can and get my dad. 
I could hear my mum and the pushchair thundering behind me. My heart was pounding in my ears as I ran like our lives depended on it. My feet crunched on some broken glass, but I didn't dare slow down. I could see the small road ahead leading to the car park of the factory. I knew what I had to do. I shouted for my dad as loudly as I could. My throat was burning as I gulped for air, as hot tears stained my red cheeks. I burst through the door crying. My dad heard and came out running. I didn't need to say anything. He grabbed the nearest object and ran out the door across the park. I stood looking out the doorway, sobbing heavily, watching my dad sprint across the car park. Relief washed over me as I saw the pushchair round the corner. My mum told my dad that we were being followed and pointed in the direction we had come from. My dad took off, but came back five minutes later. The creep was nowhere to be seen. My dad said he'd probably run off when he heard me shouting. With all the old empty buildings and wasteland, it was just too easy to disappear. My dad wanted to take the car and drive around to see if he could find him. But my mum didn't want to be left alone, even inside the sanctuary of the factory. So he agreed to finish up the job and we could go home. My parents never reported this to the police. Living in a major city, you get all kinds of unsavory characters. And because he never physically harmed us, he didn't get the chance, mind you, they probably would have chalked up his behavior to being high or mentally ill. But either way, it scared the bejesus out of us, some creep following us around in the ghost town. Ever since I returned home from a four month trip, my room wasn't the same anymore. When I was there, I usually felt a warm feeling of security and coziness, or at least I didn't feel a feeling of dread or hopelessness. I'm a guy and live with my mom and two younger brothers in a town in a very isolated valley in the middle of nowhere, and not even in town, but rather a few kilometers from it. And on top of that, my room isn't in the house, but outside of it, a shed that we revamped into my room. Well, the thing is that the first night I slept there after I came back, I immediately felt a difference. The air felt heavier, and a soft breeze blew on me all night, and I felt an ominous presence standing in the opposite corner of the room, even though I had my lamp on all night, and there wasn't anything there. Looking at that corner makes me feel dread and unprotected, and I'm in constant alert. I can't even sleep. I spend all night watching YouTube videos on my phone and keep me distracted until the sun comes up, where I finally feel better. But the feeling is there, even then. Even with my girlfriend here for the night, I still can't feel safe. Tonight, I'm going to sleep in the living room of my house because I can't stand it anymore. I'm tired of feeling unsecure while in my own room and not being able to get enough sleep. I think it's progressively getting worse, and I've only been back for two weeks. Last night I couldn't sleep at all. I ended up passing out from exhaustion at 7am, and woke up at 11 not wanting to spend any more time there. I want to know how I can fix this, and what I can do that will make it stop. So, I'm pretty sure I accidentally invited something into my house. I named it The Orla, after the short story by Guy de Malpont, where a guy does the same. It started when I lost my keys. A bunch of us were at a friend's house in a small village outside of town. They were in a band together, and I was their default roadie slash tag along, and we performed at the local venue that evening. Since his house was closest to the place, we stayed over there. We were probably about 18 to 19 years old at the time, and we were a rowdy bunch. So when our friend's mum, whose house it was, 
asked us to steal a roll-up carpet that she liked the look of from a garage down the street, we were up for it. The great carpet robbery went off without a hitch, right up until we were jogging back up the hill to the house with this thing on our shoulders. That was when the button on my trousers broke and my trousers fell. I tripped over them and the contents of my pockets went flying into the night. I found my wallet and phone, but my keys were nowhere to be seen, and I was fearful that an extended search might lead to us getting caught. So I had to give them up as lost forever on some country road in the middle of nowhere. Two weeks later, I was reading in bed when I heard them fall. I had a half attic conversion, which was a pretty big space. The rest of the floor was taken up by a spare room with a little storage space left over in the ceiling above it. There was no furniture in the middle of my room for the keys to have fallen from, let alone a way for them to have been there since I lost them about 12 miles away in the aforementioned middle of nowhere. Yet there they were, right in the middle of my carpet, and I heard them land there. After this, strange things started to happen around the house. I'd hear things in the spare room next to me, like someone moving around, but there'd be no one there when I'd check. I'd wake up to find my empty glasses beside the bed, despite being certain I hadn't drunk any of it, and my computer would randomly turn itself on in the night, waking me up with a sudden whir of its fan. One morning I was awoken by some baby birds tweeting loudly somewhere in my ceiling. I had noticed a bird coming and going outside my window, and it had obviously found a way into the space between my ceiling and the outside tiles of the roof. Just as I was contemplating how the hell I was going to deal with this, there was a loud honest to God snarl and an equally loud bang on the roof. The tweeting stopped instantly and I never heard it again. The snarl was like a dog or something, full-throated and furious. The bang was like someone slamming a fist onto a table. Another instance happened while I was at work on a Saturday morning. There was no one in the house save my girlfriend who was having a lie-in. She was on her side facing away from the bedroom door when something sat on the other side of the bed. She felt the mattress go down with the weight of whatever it was, and she froze. She didn't dare move or open her eyes. After a minute or two, the weight lifted, and she was gone. When she eventually got the courage to look around, there was no one there. She was so freaked out she rang me at work to tell me about it, and then left the house to spend the day in town until I got home. So yeah. I accidentally gave some entity keys to my place, and it took that as an invitation, and moved into my spare room. It hasn't done anything hostile so far. In fact, an argument could be made that it's trying to be helpful, but nonetheless, still freaky as hell. Many years ago, I awoke after what was easily the most vivid and detailed dream I'd ever had. In this dream, my life had simply gone on and on. I got married, moved, changed jobs, had a house and kids, and nothing was out the ordinary. Then suddenly I woke up, and I was back in my small Boston apartment, lying next to my girlfriend, and it was like a huge part of my life had never happened. The closest way I can describe it would be the feeling you get if you woke up one morning and found yourself wherever you were 15 to 20 years ago. Everyone you'd ever met in those years never existed. Every life achievement you had was a lie. Every memory was false and your entire life had instantly rewound back to a random moment many years in your past. I was so shocked and traumatized by this that I remember waking up and sobbing uncontrollably for hours, like I was grieving for the death of all my family, which in a way I was. The unexplainably bizarre part to me was how mundane this dream was. Nothing dreamlike or surreal happened, 
it felt absolutely like real life. The only difference was the time scale. In this dream, the time elapsed and was easily at least 15 or 20 years. To this day, I can still recall bits and pieces, including vague memories of my family's face, and I start to feel like I'm going to cry again. And sometimes, I can also start to get emotional at the thought that someday, I may not remember anything of the dream at all, and all those people and life memories will be gone forever. I'd never had anything like this happen before nor since, but it's still one of the most deeply scarring events that's ever happened to me, and one that I have yet to explain or understand. I was seven years old at the time this happened. One day out of the blue, I woke up having this odd feeling, like something bad would happen. I couldn't put my finger on what exactly it was, so I shrugged it off. At the time this happened, I was staying at my beloved grandmother's house. I would get to her house straight from school, do my homework, and when done, watch soap operas with her. She was sweet and caring, so she would always check on me. At night time was no exception because she knew that I had trouble sleeping, so she would sit on my bed and rub my legs. After a couple of days upon arriving from school while having lunch at her house, I received terrible news. My beloved grandma had fallen ill, my aunt informed me that she would be staying at the hospital for some time in order to get better from hepatitis B and meningitis. I would visit her every day for over a month right after school. Until one day, I wasn't allowed to see her anymore. She had health complications. Doctors feared she wouldn't make it through the night, and they were right. She passed away in her sleep that same night. When that happened, I got an overwhelming sadness, even when no one had even told me yet that she was gone. That is when that odd feeling I had started to make sense. The funeral came around, and I wasn't allowed to go, since it was no place for a child. My parents tried to shelter me from the event, hiding what death meant. They said Nana went on a trip, but I knew the truth. That hurt me in a way, because I didn't get to say goodbye. The day she was buried, I remember all the family arrived at her house to spend some time together. We shared stories, looked at pictures until time came around, and we said our goodbyes and went to bed. So I followed my usual routine and went to sleep. Later, during the middle of the night, my door creaked open. I thought nothing of it, until I saw a dent formed on my bed, like someone was sitting down, and I felt a stroke on my legs. I sat up, too tired to process what was going on, and said with a groggy voice, Good night, Nana. I waved my hand at her and began falling asleep. After that happened, I felt the mattress rose, as if she had stood up from the bed and closed the door softly. She left behind this peace and calmness. I like to believe that she came to say goodbye. Later that same year, a couple of months after my nana passed, my mum got pregnant with twins. Everything was great. That was the news and joy that we needed. Everything was wonderful. But one day, same as before, my Nana fell ill. I had this dread come over me, a feeling that something was wrong. I told my mum that I felt something was wrong, and she told me to brush it off, as it was most likely nothing. A few days after this, I sort of forgot about the feeling carried my day on as usual and went home after school. I was alone in the house doing my homework at the dinner table 
when out of nowhere I heard the sounds of babies crying from the room my parents were setting up for the twins. I could distinguish two different cries. This feeling of dread and sadness washed over me again. I decided that since I was about to be a big sister, I had to see what was going on in my baby sibling's room. Somehow I managed to gather up the courage, stand up and walk towards the door. As I approached the room, the crying started to fade away, when it was really intense before. The moment I placed my hand on the doorknob, the crying stopped. I opened up the door, and the room is empty. That night, my dad came home and told me that my mum was in the hospital, and that she would have to stay there for some time. Also, that's when she came. The babies were not going to be in her tummy anymore. Also, that when she came, the babies were not going to be in her tummy anymore. He made sure I understood they were not coming because they had passed away. I looked at my dad, muttered okay, and went to my room. I laid in bed and cried non-stop until I fell asleep. Yet I woke up in the early dawn to the feeling of a hand on my leg but I wasn't scared. So I looked over and saw a dent on my bed. The same way it happened a few months ago. I had this undeniable feeling it was my nana. I knew I could ask this from her. So I said, look out for them nana, please. Waved my hand and fell asleep again. In the morning I awoke, knowing that everything would be all right. Since that time, 14 years ago, I have not felt Nana's presence again. But I still get that dreadful feeling every time something bad will happen. You might think I'm bluffing, but it's true. And I don't like getting that feeling. It causes me to become quite anxious and reserved. Sadly, that odd feeling never fails. One time I knew a friend of mine would lose his mum and I couldn't stop it. Anyway, I'm positive my Nana is still looking out for me. So Nana, wherever you are, thank you. And I hope we do meet again. I was sleeping with my girlfriend in her grandmother's house. This night, she was crying because her grandmother had been acting very mean to her. So I woke up from bed and tried to go downstairs to speak to the grandmother. I had to cross another room to get to the stairs. When I got in there, the place was dark as hell. I couldn't find the light and couldn't see my own hands. After a few steps, I couldn't even see my girlfriend's room, even though I'd left the door open. So I made my way to the opposite wall where there should have been a door. But all I touch is wood. No furniture, no door. Only wood everywhere I put my hands. At this time, I saw some grey smoke from the corner of my eyes, at the place where a mirror should have been. I started freaking out a little bit, and I decided to go take my phone into the bedroom to make some light. I couldn't see the bedroom, so I followed the cries of my girlfriend. I couldn't call her because she was trying to sleep. The cries get louder. I find a door, I turn on the lights, and I'm not in my girlfriend's room. I'm in the stairs, at the exact opposite place I was supposed to be. This made no sense according to the directions I took in the room and the source of the cries. So I go downstairs to speak to the grandmother. Then I go back upstairs. This time the room wasn't so dark anymore. I could clearly see the furniture and the door of my girlfriend's room. Strangely, there was no wood. The walls were now stone. I really didn't know what all the wood was when I touched it before, since nothing matched the surface I felt under my fingers. I get in bed with my girlfriend and she asks me, why did you sleep in the other room? I haven't, I said. Don't lie. 
I heard you in bed with the mattress squeaking. Turns out, she felt like I had left for far longer than I had, and she couldn't see the door of her own bedroom during all this time. The day after, we tried to investigate the room, but there was definitely no wooden surface. We asked the grandmother who told us several people had died in this room, as it's a very old European house. She'd also fallen unconscious twice in this very place, one year ago to the day. This happened some months ago, and I still can't explain what happened this night. Set the way back machine to late summer slash early autumn of 2001. I was 19 and had just transferred from the big city college I went to for my freshman year to the college in the small town near where I grew up. I was attempting to keep the relationship with my high school sweetheart going, but surprise surprise it failed not long after. Anyway, I digress. Not long after I started there, I met the man who would soon become my best friend, and remain so to this day, Jimmy. We'd first meet up at some stupid lock-in event, and had kept talking after that. I wouldn't call us friends at this point, but we were good enough acquaintances that he invited me to attend a White Wolf gaming session he ran. Well, as a nerd who played D&D, and Magic the Gathering all the way through high school, I leapt at the opportunity. So we do the adventure, and then afterwards, Jimmy asks me if I'll help him park his car. Jimmy and everyone else who had a car that lived in the dorm parked in the dorm lot on weekends, as the dorm lot was free to use Friday night through Sunday evening. You needed to have a plan for your car though during the weekdays. This town has permit parking, and the permits are only available to permanent residents, i.e. not college kids. This was to prevent the cars the students would bring to school from clogging up the town street parking. The school had a big student lot, but it was a joke. It was just a big unpaved gravel lot, way beyond the campus boundaries that had no security and was basically the Wild West. Everyone who ever had to use it hated it. Plus, the school charged an obscene amount of money for a pass. So Jimmy's solution was to drive his car out beyond the boundaries of the permit parking to the outer part of town, away from the college, and park on the street there for free. It was a long walk back, but he didn't mind. Today though, he asked me if I'd follow him in my car to where he parks and give him a ride back since it was Sunday evening, and everyone had to get their cars out of the dorm before morning. I didn't have a problem with parking, since like I said I grew up there, and my grandma lived in town, so I could just park in her garage. So we load up in the decrepit old family minivan that Jimmy's parents had given him when he went off to school, and they had brought a new vehicle. And we drive the few blocks to my grandmother's house, where I get my car and proceed to follow him out where he parks. My car wasn't exactly a banger either. It was a 1989 Ford Country Squire. You know, one of the giant old station wagons that were basically long steel tanks with faux wood grain on the side. This street ran up a hill. As we're proceeding up it, I notice two little girls walking up it on the other side of the road. I'd estimate one to be nine or ten, and the other to be six or seven. As we approach, they look behind them, and speed up their pace. Jimmy pulls off at the first available spot on the street, which happens to be right beside where the girls are walking. I stop my car right by his van, just a few feet from these girls. So now picture the situation from the girls' point of view. They are out for a walk. Their heads doubtlessly filled all their lives, with tales of stranger danger, and creepy men in old cars looking to snatch away children. And they have just seen not one, but two old junkers. One of them, a van with curtains in the back window, that followed them up the street, and abruptly stopped right next to them. The girls in unison just start hauling ass. I mean, they're booking it at full sprint, as fast as their little legs could carry them, as they charge up the hill and turn down the first side street. Jimmy gets out of his van, looks after them for a second, 
and then gets in my car. We exchange a look. Do they think we're... He begins. Yeah, dude. They think that we're totally trying to take them. There's a moment of silence, and then we both just lose it laughing. We probably sit idling for 15 to 20 seconds, howling with laughter, before I manage to choke out, we should probably get the hell out of here before the cops arrive, and off we go. I could never think of the sight of those poor two girls running away up the street from what they imagined to be weirdo takers without a chuckle. Those girls have to be in their mid to late twenties now. So ladies, on the off chance one of you hears this and recognises yourself, I'm sorry, we didn't mean to scare you, but you've given Jimmy and I an amusing anecdote we often share. About eight years ago, my family and I took a trip down to Tombstone, Arizona, one of the more famous ghost towns in that area of the US. I was quite a bit into the paranormal at the time, so naturally was more than excited to stop by the haunted birdcage theatre. No, I didn't see anything at the time while taking the photos. However, about five minutes after taking that photo, my brother started freaking out about seeing a figure in the same area. It's neat that after looking through the photos, we had something to back his experience up. My favourite thing about the photos is that this isn't just some random black blob. This is an actual female figure. Even with the image quality being what it is, you can still zoom in and make out a surprising amount of detail. A necklace is easily visible. You can also make out bare shoulders and where the dress starts. Details of the face are harder to make out, but I almost want to say it looks like she's wearing a bird mask. The other photos pretty much debunk most possibilities of this being camera trickery, especially when you look at the side by side comparison. But hey, if anyone can come up with a reasonable non-paranormal explanation for this photo, I'd love to hear it. Needless to say, I've been pretty convinced of the paranormal ever since. The stairs in my house are so old that they creak when someone goes up them. And since everyone has a different weight and a different way of walking up the stairs, I can usually tell who it is coming up. So one night when I'm the only person in the house who's awake, I hear the stairs creak one by one starting at the bottom. Unfamiliar footsteps. When they reach the top, I convince myself to take a look. I check. No one there. I didn't hear anyone go down the stairs, and the hallway that connects to the top of the stairs creaks just as loudly and the door at the bottom of the stairs is closed. There was just nothing there. Nobody used the stairs. It could be explained by the house being old, but the stairs making noise one by one in the middle of the night, that just doesn't happen. I lived with my parents and my two Staffordshire Bull Terriers and was enjoying the six week summer holiday from school. I got home one day at around 7 p.m. and after a long day out with friends and playing football, I decided to get a snack from the fridge. My dad was at work, mum was in the living room with my two dogs who were asleep on their bed and all I could hear was the very faint sound of the TV through the two walls that separated the kitchen from the living room. Here's a brief description of the kitchen. We had a small space under the stairs that you could access from the kitchen, where we kept shoes, coats, and some other bits and pieces. The fridge was literally five steps away, and the space under the stairs would be on your left-hand side when facing the fridge, and is nearly pitch black, as we had no light in there. I opened the fridge and had a quick browse of what was on offer to crave my hunger. When out of nowhere there was a deep, 
guttural growl from the space under the stairs. This growl lasted for about five seconds. I used to think that people exaggerated when they said that they froze in fear, but I literally couldn't move. My eyes opened wide, and my hands started to shake, and after about ten seconds of standing completely still, I slowly turned to look at the space, as I knew that it had come from there. As I turned and looked at the space, there was nothing. All I could see was the darkness, but I had that feeling of something staring at me intently. The gut feeling screaming at me to run away and that I was in serious peril. I was certain that something was going to crawl out of the darkness and drag me into it. The worst part was that I had to walk past the space to get to the kitchen door. I slowly made my way to the door and the feeling of danger and dread intensified with every step I took. I ran the last few, swung the door open, and bolted into the living room. My mum looked at me, and she saw how white I was and asked why I was shaking. She asked what was wrong, and I told her what happened. I also asked if the dogs had growled, or if there was anything on TV that could have made a noise like that but my mum said she hadn't heard anything from the dogs or TV that could have been perceived as a growl. My mum grabbed a torch and headed to the kitchen. Sure enough, she came back and said there was nothing there and that it must have been my imagination. But I know what I heard and I know that my gut feeling was not just my imagination. There was something under those stairs that seriously wanted to hurt or terrify me. I haven't had any other experiences like that since, and I always become nervous if I'm left in the kitchen alone. I'm 22 now, and still refuse to go anywhere near this space under the stairs. I live in New York, and have done for a number of years. I spend most of my free time in Central Park, to the point where I could be dropped into any part of it and know where I was and find my way to any other point in the park without issue. Which is why this is so disturbing. I was walking home in the evening from the west side of the park. I had to walk directly across a wide open field to the east side of the park. No winding paths, no obstructions to get around. Just walk straight across some ball fields while looking directly at a distinctly ugly building on the east side. I walk for about 15 minutes towards the distinctively ugly building, which puts me on the east side of the park. I pass some guys playing baseball and a playground with a big concrete climbing thing and walk a few more minutes and exit on the street. Immediately I know something is wrong, but it's so bizarre that it takes me a minute to figure out what. The park is on the wrong side of me. Sure enough, I look up, and the sign says W 100th. I'm back where I started, feeling incredibly disoriented and all around confused. Okay, that was weird. I must have just spaced out somehow and gotten turned around. Back into the park I go, and this time I make it a point to keep checking that the distinctively ugly building on the east side is in my line of sight and concentrate. I walk halfway across the field, checking the distinctively ugly building. I walk past the same baseball game. Distinctively ugly building, still good to go. I walk out of the field onto the path, past the playground with the climby thing, and follow the path out of the park. My heart sinks immediately. W 100th Street. I'm now legitimately freaked out. I can't decide if it's some weird house of leaves kind of stuff, or if I'm having some kind of blackout and neither idea are comforting. I try to logic it out, and figure out where I could possibly have turned around, and I can't, 
I didn't walk back past anything. Not the ball players, not the playground, and not the field. I seriously consider just taking a cab, but suddenly feel sympathy for every idiot horror movie protagonist, because I just have to know. I walk into the park again, retrace my steps exactly, keep my eye on the distinctively ugly building just like last time, and walk past the same baseball players, the same as last time, onto the path and just past the playground with the concrete climby thing. I follow the path out the park, and I'm on E 100th Street. I still have no idea how it happened. I've never been able to replicate it. Logically, there must be something weird about the line of sight, or the little stretch of path leading out. Less logically, Olmsted was a creepy wizard, who created portals, and I took a quick stroll through the twilight zone. I think there is something paranormal in my apartment. I moved in October 31st, 2018, without the knowledge or knowing a previous tenant had died in the apartment. I'm a paramedic, so I can deal with death a little differently than others. So when I found out from my downstairs neighbor, Gina, it didn't bother me. According to my neighbor, the tenant, Katie, was a younger female in her early 30s, who had reluctantly given birth to her first child. Gina said Katie was a nice woman, but had history of drug abuse and had an abusive boyfriend who was also her drug dealer. Shortly after, Katie gave birth to her child, and she was found dead in the apartment from a heroin overdose while holding the baby. I did not ask specific details of where she was found, because that I didn't want to know. I work night shift, so I am usually sleeping during the day, unless it's the days off where I try to turn myself around and be a normal human being to interact with the world at daytime. For the past month and a half, I've been waking up between 3 and 3.30, and can't explain why. Sometimes I will have to use the bathroom, and other times I just wake up and am unable to go back to sleep. About a week ago, something eerie happened. I was asleep in my bed, with my dog and cat, when I woke up to what sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder in my ear. It didn't jolt me awake or startle me. I was more confused than anything. Afterwards, I was unable to fall back asleep and just stayed awake until the afternoon because I worked that night. And when I looked at the time, I noticed it was 3.13 a.m. I got home after work at around 8 a.m. I laid down and had trouble sleeping because my downstairs neighbor Gina and her husband Robert were pulling up carpet and pounding on the walls with what I can only assume was a hammer for six hours because when I woke up at 2 p.m. they were still at it. I attempted to go to sleep around 10 p.m. that night but probably fell asleep at midnight. I woke up at 3.12 a.m., annoyed not being able to fall back asleep, but something was off this night. I sleep with my door cracked open, so that the cat can come and go as it pleases, and I've never had an issue with it until this day. I felt as if someone was watching me in the hallway. I then rolled over and scrolled through Facebook for about an hour and a half, and decided to go run a bath. I got out of the bath at 5 a.m. and walked into my bedroom when I heard a sound at the front of the apartment. I can't really describe this sound, but if anything, it sounded like a thud. I walked out of my room and into the front of the apartment and saw that the light covered to my kitchen light was hanging. I thought it was odd, but really didn't pay attention to it and put it back. I took my mum to breakfast that morning, 
and decided to tell her what I had experienced. She knows about Katie's passing in the apartment, and she has also experienced paranormal activity personally. My mum kind of shrugged it off, and said I have difficulty sleeping due to working nights, and that a light cover falling isn't a big deal. Respectfully, I agreed, and after breakfast we went to the grocery store, and I returned back to my apartment and my brother came over to help bring up all the groceries because I live on the second floor and no one likes doing multiple trips to get groceries out the car. While I was finishing, my mum called me and asked where I was. When I told her I was still at my apartment, she asked if I was messing with her. Confused, I said no and asked why. At that point, my mum told me to hurry up and get to her apartment. When I arrived, my mum was in her bedroom looking visibly nervous. She was supposed to have come and inspected her sprinkler that day in her apartment, and so she had her bedroom door shut. She said that while she was laying in bed, someone knocked hardly on her door three times, causing the entire door to shake. After opening the door, she noticed no one was there. She said that she checked the entire apartment and no one was in it, and that the front door was still locked. Trying to recreate the sound and shaking of the door, the only possible way was if someone knocked directly on her bedroom door with force. After leaving my mum's apartment, I went back to mine, and once I met the front door, I had an uneasy feeling. I can't explain why, but as soon as I got up to the door, it just felt like a negative energy. I went in, greeted my animals, and decided I was going to take a nap, due to barely getting any sleep the night before. I went into my bedroom, which is in the very back of the apartment, and went to lay down. My dog followed suit, and jumped on the bed and came to her spot. She sleeps in the same spot every time we go to bed, which is at the top of the bed right next to me. I noticed when she jumped on the bed, she was slow to get to her spot. What she did, she immediately looked up at the ceiling above my head, prompting me to look and see if there was a bug. There was nothing. My dog proceeded to look at the ceiling and look away for short periods of time. Approximately 20 minutes before, she refused to sleep in her spot and went to the end of the bed to lay down, still looking at the ceiling. I was unnerved, but somehow managed to fall asleep. When I woke up about an hour later, I was drenched in sweat. Like you would have to be breaking a fever. I kept my apartment at 68 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer. I have a fan on me and sleep in light clothes. I usually get cold and do not wake up hot, so I thought this was odd. Later that night, I had a friend over and we were sitting on the couch watching movies. Let me explain the layout of the living room. When you walk through the front door, you're immediately met by a wall. If you look to the right, there is a closet. And if you look to the left, the living room is right there. I have a sliding glass back door that leads to the balcony, with the blinds that almost every apartment complex has. I have a large sectional couch, and the only way for it to fit is block that back door. At around 2.30am while watching a movie, horror of course, we heard two knocks directly behind our heads on the back door. We both looked at each other, and I said, there's no way that a person could be on my balcony. I open the blinds within probably 15 seconds, and look out. Obviously no one's there. At this point, I'm getting creeped out. He ended up staying until sunrise at 6.30 a.m. and then left. I didn't plan on going to sleep until it was daylight at this point. 
I had trouble sleeping during these days, because all I could think about is what kind of spirit is in my home, or is it something worse? I used a Ouija board when I was 14, so I have my own experience from that, and it's not something I want to relive. One of my co-workers is very spiritual, and cleanses her house weekly because she buys a lot of antique furniture, so she is the first person I contacted. She told me I needed to go get white sage, and that she would send me cleansing prayers, but that I needed to do it soon. I unfortunately worked all weekend, and this was Friday, so I could not go to do it immediately. So I stayed at my parents' house until I could. After work, I went to my apartment and was met with the negative energy again once I reached the door. I had to get my cat and dog because I was not letting them in there alone. It might be silly, but I didn't want to go in there and I'm not going to leave them there. The next day, I needed to go back and gather some clothes and sleep clothes. So I convinced my brother and his girlfriend to go with me. My brother's skeptical about paranormal things, but his girlfriend, like I am, is a believer. I take it seriously to not provoke or enrage with a spirit, so I had chosen to ignore. Unfortunately, my brother did not get this memo, and as we were walking up to the door, my brother said, Maybe I'll believe it if it moves the blind or something. I told him not to taunt it, but he didn't listen. I grabbed what I needed and headed back down to the car. When I got to the driver's side door, something was telling me to look up at the balcony. And when I did, the blinds were moving back and forth. I looked over at my brother and his girlfriend and said, Do you believe me now? And the look on their faces confirmed that they saw the exact thing I did. I'm going to smudge the apartment but I'm curious if anyone knows what type of spirit I might be dealing with. I haven't been hurt by anything, and everything that has happened to me has been subtle and not alarming. I'm moving out next month. I wasn't renewing my lease to begin with, so this has nothing to do with not staying there anymore. This all started happening mostly after Gina and Robert were remodeling their apartment. They recently just got back from a trip and anyway, they saw me outside and said they would speak to me since they got a home a few weeks ago. And they don't talk to me and are acting strange since then. Gina is avid for being outside watering her garden. But I've noticed her garden is dying. And I don't see her outside anymore. Robert's vehicle hasn't moved from its parking spot since they got back. And he usually leaves every day. Would there be something sinister going on here? I have three separate experiences to share. The first is when I was 15. It was an ordinary school day, and I was on the bus going to school. Usually I sit by the window and watch all the buildings that we pass by. So I happened to memorize the ones that stood out. One of those was an old grocery store that is right next to a pet shop where I bought my dog. I know that once I pass those buildings, I am five minutes away from school and that I need to get ready. So again, I was on the bus going to school and it hadn't been 15 minutes since I boarded the bus. When I looked out to see that we had just passed by the grocery store and pet shop. I was stunned and confused. I didn't remember dozing off or anything. Looking around, I realized I was the only one confused. So I calmed myself down. Once I was done arranging my stuff, putting on my necktie and such, I looked out the window and to my absolute shock, we were passing the grocery store and pet shop again. The girl sitting next to me probably saw my face turning pale and asked me what was going on. Of course, I made up an excuse, saying I suddenly felt dizzy as I didn't want to sound crazy. 
The second event was at my best friend's house for movie night. It was a Saturday, and I planned on spending the evening with her and her brothers. Anyway, to get to her house, I have to ride a train. My stop was on the 12th station after I initially boarded the subway. And it was a bit of a habit of mine to stop what I'm doing every time the train stops so that I know where I'm currently at. I was on my fifth stop back and then as usual, I turned my eyes from my phone to the doorway to see where I was. It was the seventh station. I waited for the doors to close. Then I looked down at my phone again to continue reading. A few minutes later, the train slowed down again as it reached the next station. Once it finally stopped, the doors opened and I realized I had reached my destination. I even blinked twice to ensure I wasn't seeing things, but sure enough, we were really here. I scrambled to get my things and ran out the doors. And when I finally calmed myself down, that was when the shock came. How in the world had I managed to pass five more stations without noticing? I told my friend about this one once I reached her house, and she mentioned that it was something like a glitch in the reality. It kind of annoyed me to see that this amused her, to know that I experienced something like it. But nonetheless, I ignored it, and we went on with our day. This third experience happened in my own home recently. I usually wake up early to prepare breakfast for my younger siblings, especially if our mum is away on business trip. It's my obligation as the eldest after all, and my youngest sister Mari usually wakes up at around seven, just before I finish preparing breakfast, and she has the habit of asking loudly, what's for breakfast? That particular day I woke up extra early, but started making food nonetheless. I thought that if I finished early, I would have time to play video games for the rest of the day. I finished cooking around 6.30, and just as I was about to clean up, I heard footsteps coming down from the stairs. It sounded like the other foot was being dragged as the person walks, much like a zombie. That instance, I knew it was Mari. She's the only one who walks like that in the mornings. Sure enough, as if on cue, she asks from the doorway, what's for breakfast? My back was turned, but I still answered her. Eggs and pancakes. I know you and Dina like them. Then I heard a small humming response. When I turned to look a few moments later, there was no one there. And there wasn't a sign that anyone had been there except for me. A chill ran down my spine. And at first I thought I saw a ghost. But then I remembered what my friend had told me about the glitches in the matrix. And I thought this was another one of those. It was nonetheless very confusing and creepy. This happened around 14 years ago. I was around eight at the time, and at a family cookout in a haunted ghost town called Pickneyville in South Carolina. Now I know what you're thinking. Why the hell am I at a cookout in a ghost town? Well, a family friend owns the land that surrounds it and still does. I'm not sure what the event was for, but back then we were always barbecuing and riding ATVs through the trails of rural upstate South Carolina. It is just what we did. Now I had always heard stories about this place from my mother and father, but always brushed them off as bull or campfire tales. There's also rumors of the area being inhabited by devil worshippers, but I'm unsure if that's true or not. I just didn't really believe this place was truly haunted. Until. Me and my cousin were riding our ATVs down one of the many trails. Just me, him and no one else. We're both really young. It's broad daylight and we're riding down and both need to take a whiz. So we stop, cut off our rides and do what we need to do. Now I can't speak for my cousin, but I felt really weird like something just didn't seem right. Everything seemed dead. 
There was no wind, no birds chirping, nothing. So after we relieved ourselves, we turned around and noticed a dilapidated building. Why we didn't notice this before, I don't know. Regardless, we were curious, but we knew enough history of the area to not go messing around in old buildings. So we looked around and quickly noticed old tombstones that could easily have been mistaken for large rocks. They were very old and weathered. We had just taken a leak on an old haunted graveyard. We looked at each other at the exact same time and I could see the, oh shit, look in his eye before he even said it. We quickly jumped back on our ATVs and desperately tried to start the engines to no avail. I turned the key, pushed the start button and nothing. It was almost as if the battery was dead and my cousin's ATV again was the same. For about 10 seconds, we just tried to get our vehicles to start. And luckily, just when we thought we were screwed, at the same time, both our engines fired up and we proceeded to get out of there as quick as possible. When we got back to the rest of our families, we didn't mention it to anyone. I really don't know why, but I was just happy to be within the safety of my dad. We didn't ride the ATVs for the rest of the day, and I haven't been to Pickneyville since. I am a very scientifically minded person, but some things have happened throughout my life that I cannot explain. First off, I'm going to call the road I live off Highway X for privacy reasons. I've lived there my entire life, 1998 to present. I like to describe where I live as the middle of nowhere surrounded by other people. Where I live used to be a revolutionary war township. No battles happened here though. Nobody has died on my subdivision either. In the mid 20th century, the portion of Highway X I lived at used to be a Girl Scout camp. And in the early 90s, before my family moved here, our property was a cow pasture. We did have a teenage girl die in 2006, taking a sharp turn about a quarter of a mile from my house. In 2011, two miles away from my house, on one of the gravel roads branching off Highway X, a mother drove into a creek during high water, as there are no protective barriers there and she and her children drowned. My mother is very religious, and when I ask questions about her experiences, she gets nervous and is reluctant to answer them. I'm going to tell these stories in chronological order. When I was a baby, my mum heard someone saying, hi there, hi, in a cooing kind of way over the baby monitor. She said she couldn't tell if the voice was male or female, she went to my dad who was on the computer and asked him if he was just in my room. He said no. Now, this could easily be debunked because baby monitors can pick up radio signals, but it was still strange. When I was a bit older, perhaps two or three, my mum said she was sitting on our front porch and saw a man with a wide brimmed hat and trench coat standing under the outdoor lights at our neighbor's house just standing there doing nothing. She said she didn't think much of it. Just thought, that's not Charlie. Charlie doesn't wear hats like that. And eventually went back inside because it was weirding her out. Fast forward 10 years, and she said her best friend's husband was casually telling a story about how his dad was haunted by a man that fit the exact same description. Not knowing anything about my mum's story, the man didn't leave his dad alone until his dad said, get out of my house. My mom's best friend freaked out when she went that when she was little, she saw a man exactly like that pass a window at her grandma's house. And then my mom freaked out and told her story. My mom told me this. So I consulted my best friend Google and apparently it's something a lot of people see. 
Around the same time, she saw the man in the hat. My dad heard someone knock three times at our door. It was night time, and my dad looked out the window to see no one there. My mum grew up hearing stories from my grandma, a nurse, who always told stories about people at her job hearing three knocks on the door, opening it, and then dying soon after. So of course, my mum freaks out and tells her not to open the door. When I was about 12, I started getting hypoangonic hallucinations. When I'd close my eyes, I would see vivid, disturbing images, oftentimes of people being hanged or covered in blood. It was terrifying, gory stuff, and I hadn't seen my first horror film until I was 16. So of course it really bothered me, and I wasn't inspired by anything I'd seen on television. It stopped happening once I moved into my dorm. But when I do get this, it's only at my house. When I was 13, we had a light switch in the basement that could dim when you press it. I had a sleepover in the basement with my friends, and we were talking about boys or whatever 13 year old girls talk about. And suddenly, the lights started dimming and brightening repeatedly. We of course freaked out. And then it stopped, and never did it again the entire time we had that lighting set up. One night when I was 15, my ex-boyfriend and I were driving down Highway X, and both complained about feeling like something was wrong. This was about two miles from my house, and then we saw what looked like a cloaked figure fly over our car. It looked like the Grim Reaper. We both saw it, and we both screamed in unison. I told my dad, and he said that when he feels like something bad is about to happen, he's usually right, and I shouldn't deny that feeling. Two years later, I walk past the hallway entrance and I hear, Hi! Right in my ear, loud and clear. I shrieked and I sprinted to my mum, and asked her if the TV was on in her room, and she said no. She was right. A few months ago, I walked into the living room and saw my mum's recliner was empty. And I remember thinking, wow, my mum must have went to bed already. And she didn't even tell me. The next morning, my mum asked me if she talked to me after she left for bed. I told her no, and that I remember thinking it was odd that she didn't even say goodnight. She said she woke up after falling asleep in the recliner and saying, I'm going to bed. And she heard a voice behind her that didn't exactly sound like me say, Oh, you're going to bed? She also said our next door neighbour had something in her house, but didn't elaborate and didn't give me a time frame or anything. When she told me this, I already asked enough questions about weird stuff going on around Highway X, and she's not comfortable talking about the paranormal too much, because she's afraid It'll invite spirits. This happened about 11 years ago, when I was working as a logistics operative in a warehouse in the UK. I worked with a good bunch of people, one of them being my mum. She helped me get the job there, and as we were very close, I enjoyed working with her. The warehouse we worked at had shelves upon shelves of products which lined the length of the warehouse and it had a walkway through the middle. Off to one side was the packing area for products that were ready to be shipped out to customers. I was in the packing area on this particular day with the rest of my colleagues and was facing the shelves. I glanced up and saw my mum walking down the walkway and she was looking at me. I smiled, but she didn't smile back, and just kept walking with a blank expression on her face, which is not like my mum at all. She's a very happy person, everyone likes her, and like I said, we're very close, so there's no way she'd look at me without acknowledging me. I look at her, with confusion sprawled all over my face, still watching her walk up the walkway away from me, and everyone. Apart from the non-expressive look on her face, 
I remember thinking something else wasn't quite right with how she looked. There was something different that I couldn't put my finger on. Her eyes, they looked hollow, like I was looking into a dark abyss. I looked down for a split second to the job I was doing behind me, through a door that you have to have a key card to open. At that moment, my mum walked in. I was so confused. It wasn't possible for her to be walking through the warehouse and then be behind me in a matter of seconds. I would have seen her if she had tried to go past me. There was no other way around. I asked my mum where she had been and she said she'd been with the customer service team upstairs for the past half hour, trying to sort out a query. My face must have said it all because my mum asked me what was wrong but I didn't answer. I sprinted down the warehouse all the way to the back, looking down every aisle, but found no one. I got back to my mum as she asked me again, and I told her exactly what I'd seen. She was creeped out, but she believed me. Nothing like this has ever happened since, and it really freaked me out. It still does to this day, and I have no idea what that thing was. But all that I know is that it definitely wasn't my mum. My grandpa told me this story about his mum. They were both extremely down to earth, honest people. So this is the only supernatural story that I fully believe. His mum had a display case full of china and silverware. If you've never seen something like this, Imagine a bunch of glass cupboard style doors made of glass. You couldn't touch any of the contents without opening the door. Also, it's a display case, which means that no one ever opens it unless they're bored of the display. So she's walking by this in her living room and as soon as she just passes it, one of her favorite spoons crashes to the floor. My grandma described it much more than a fall. It was as if someone had thrown it to the ground with force. Shivers went down her spine. She quickly jumps around and sees what she expected. A spoon about 10 feet from the display case. She didn't know what else to do. So she opened one of the doors and put the spoon back where it belongs. When she shut the door, she gets a call and answers it to find out her brother had passed away. The craziest part to me is that a year after I heard this story, my close friend told me an almost identical story, save with a fork. I do not and have never believed in anything supernatural, but I fully believe this, and have spent a lot of time thinking about how this is possible. I don't fully believe it yet, but my best explanation for this is that our souls don't die and that they are always a part of our life somehow. Several years ago, my ex-partner and I visited his parents in North Yorkshire, England for a short break. We did lots of sightseeing and visiting while we were there. One of the days his parents asked if we would like them to take us out on a day to a place called Ravenscar. Them driving, knowing how much local knowledge his father had of the area, because before he retired, he was high up in the local council. And we decided it would be a nice day out because it's always nice to go places where people have knowledge of the area and local history. Ravenscar has quite a bit of history going back to being a Roman signal station. But more recently in the late 19th and early 20th century, they tried turning it into a holiday resort like Scarborough, which isn't too far away. This fascinated us because it's one of Britain's ghost towns because it was never finished and was abandoned. However, I must add at the time of us going there, we knew nothing apart from the bit of information his father gave us. Anyway, when we were there, he drove us around the site slowly. When the finished roads showed us points of interest, like complete pavements, drains, areas marked out where hotels and houses were gonna be built 
but just never were. Just like driving around a small housing estate, where the roads and pavements were finished, but the buildings were never built. It was fascinating and quite eerie. There's also a mine, and old brickwork as well as an abandoned railway line. Anyway, now the weird bit. Several years later we visited again, this time taking my children. We thought it would be fun to take them there and show them a bit of local history and let them run around. We told them all about it and some of the things that they would see. But just as we drove in, we thought we must have taken a wrong turn because there was nothing there, just a big field. We drove a short distance to the information center to ask them where it was because we couldn't remember. The woman looked at us like we were insane and said, this is the right place. Extremely confused, we decided to walk back to the site to see if we could see what we did several years earlier. But it was nothing like it. There was just dirt tracks and no roads, no pavements, only remnants of where they had been. The odd drain, but nothing like what we'd seen. By now the children thought we'd gone mad, and honestly we couldn't give them answers. When we got back to his parents' house and told them about our experience, we only felt more insane because they told us what we described didn't exist and clearly had been something very different to what was there now and also than what his parents were seeing when they drove us around that day. What happened? I'll never know. But it stayed with me and I often think about it because it was such a surreal experience. I live with my boyfriend and his parents. There is a large bay window where the walls round out into the kitchen. The sliding glass door is close to it. So you can see through this sliding glass door, a small stretch of wall and then the bay window. My boyfriend's mum and I got done talking in the kitchen for a while and she went upstairs to have a nap. I looked out the sliding glass door from an angle and saw his mum in the exact same outfit I saw her wearing in everything, walking from the side of the house out to the yard. The small wall was blocking my view, so I went up to the bay window to see where she went. No one was there. My boyfriend was coming down the stairs, so I had him check, and literally no one was there. No explanation. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before and creeped out and now can't sleep. This happened about seven years ago. I was 16 years old at the time and was home alone with only my younger sister Nadine, who was nine at the time. Our only parent was my mum. She worked a full graveyard shift from 10 to 7 and we had easily become accustomed to it because we would usually be a sleeper at school when she was working. Every night was the same. Get home from school, homework, shower, say bye to mum and sleep. Often me and my sister would stay up late despite my mum's orders, but nothing crazy ever happened. We lived in an upstairs two bedroom apartment. At night, me and Nadine would barricade ourselves in our mother's room, lock the door and sleep. We were always too scared to sleep in separate rooms. Our mother had the key to every door in the apartment, and this specific night, me and Nadine were in the living room watching yet another Family Guy episode. It was getting late, close to midnight, and we definitely had school the next day. As we were preparing for bed, Someone knocked on the front door of the apartment. Now this apartment complex had two doors, one metal door on the outside, and then the door made of wood which was technically inside. Therefore, one would need to unlock two doors before they could get it. I looked at Nadine. Is mum home early? I put my ear to the door, and then they knocked again. Who is it? I said through the door and there was no response. I ordered Nadine to call mum, 
but there was no answer. I looked through the peephole and couldn't see anything. It was dark, and whoever it was wasn't tall enough to even see a silhouette. Nadine went to unlock the door, but I yelled at her to stop. My mum always told me she would call for an emergency, and she has the keys to the apartment, and she would have no reason to knock. Before I could come up with a plan, whoever was on the other side of the door began pounding on it as they were no longer knocking. It sounded like they were banging with a closed fist. As if on cue, Nadine and I ran into my mother's room and locked the door. She began to cry, and I tried to console her but was too scared. I waited a few moments in hopes that they would go away or my mum would call and yell at us to open the door. Two minutes passed, and my mum called us back. She saw that we called her, and took a break as soon as she could call us back. I told her about the knocking, and she urged us not to exaggerate. Whoever it was was gone now, and we were okay. She blamed it on perhaps a lone drunk, or someone looking for trouble. But regardless, to not open the door, and told us to go to bed. I had been tossing and turning. It had been about an hour since the first knocking, when suddenly it started up again. Nadine and I shot up. The knocking was now at our bedroom door, and there were no lights on in the apartment, which spooked me further. Who's in our home? I called my mum, and she answered on the first ring. They're knocking at the bedroom door. I was in tears, beyond scared. Nadine had hidden in the closet. While my mum was on the phone, they pounded on the door again, and I extended my arm out with the phone in hand so that she could hear. The pounding was so intense, I felt at any moment how they would break the lock on our door and rush in. She called 911 and came home that night. When she reached the front door, both doors were locked. The officers searched the home for any signs of entry which wasn't likely since we were on the upstairs level. Nothing was ever found. Nadine and I still talk about this stuff sometimes, because if it hadn't have happened to both of us, I don't think either of us would have believed each other. A couple of years back, me and a friend were doing a road trip. It was here where we discovered something rather unusual a ghost town. I don't want to say exactly where it is for fear of sounding insane. Anyway, we approached the town with trepidation. Of course, we didn't realize it was abandoned at first. Roads unkept, grass growing everywhere along with weeds, extremely high. Houses completely torn apart. Doors had been ripped off the hinges, windows shattered, and a whole load of graffiti. As we drove around, it became increasingly more apparent that people no longer inhabited this area. Roots of trees were already taking back the road, and foliage was covering a large part of some of the houses. We drove around for a little bit, and after getting bored after about five minutes, we decided it was enough driving around and wanting to explore just a little bit. We left our vehicles and looked around. In the middle of the village, there was a bandstand with a square that, despite being abandoned, was still in pretty good shape. There was something about it that really drew me to it. So as my friend went to look at one of the houses behind where we parked the car, I decided to go look at that instead. As my feet started walking across the grass, I approached the bandstand with trepidation. I climbed the three or four steps to be on the concrete of the structure and looked around and surveyed the area. That's when I noticed something very eerie. I looked up. There was a pentagram painted on the roof of the bandstand, 
and as I looked around, I saw a chicken carcass, or what I think was a chicken carcass, hanging from a rope by the top. It was severely decayed. It had obviously been there for a very long time. The meat was partially still on it, blackened and disgusting. The funny thing is, I didn't smell anything, but the moment I saw it, I bolted and started running back to the vehicle. But my friend had locked the car and was still in one of the houses. I started screaming for him and he told me to calm down and that it was probably just a prank. He convinced me that I was being ridiculous and he carried on the exploration. I chose to sit by the car and wait, however. A few minutes later, do I hear my friend's voice from the house. He's screaming, taking two steps at a time, runs out the hole where the door was and unlocks the car and jumps into the driver's seat. I don't even need to ask. I'm looking at the house where he's running out of and that's where I see a man completely disheveled and insane looking with a crazy look in his eye wielding a blood-stained hatchet we don't speak we just drive we stopped at a gas station and discussed what we saw before filling up our gas however our dialogue was extremely limited you see the guy yeah do you think he strung up that chicken there? Yeah. Yeah, me too. That was about as much as we said about it. And when we looked at each other, there was an unspoken sort of agreement that we would never discuss this again. Why was a crazy man living in the middle of nowhere in a ghost town? I don't think I'll ever know. Nor do I want to find out. About two years ago, my friends and I visited Letchworth Village in Rockland County, New York. It was a psychiatric hospital for the mentally and physically disabled, opened in 1911, and was the site of the first polio vaccine trials in the United States. Letchworth was finally shut down in the 90s because of the rampant abuse and mistreatment of the living patients, but many of the hospital's abandoned buildings are still standing on campus, and most are decayed enough or already broken into to be easily accessible. The final building we explored was once the main hospital. My friend mentioned that this place was apparently featured on some ghost hunters type show, one of the most haunted places in America, or something like that and we were pretty excited when we saw that someone had graffitied on the walls the ghosts are here the first room had rusted metal bars suspended by wires hanging from the ceiling this in itself was not out of the ordinary but as we entered a gust of wind shook the bars which began to swing and clank eerily against each other Needless to say, it was a nice spooky entrance. Upon entering that tetanus trap, we entered a long hallway with a big staircase leading to the basement and the second floor. Ignoring every single horror film infused instinct to not go down the flight of foreboding stairs into what could very well be the gates of hell, we climbed down to the basement which of course was extremely dark, save for a welcoming burst of light streaming in from a broken window near the stairs. With our flashlights on, we made our way slowly through the basement hall, and at about halfway we found the old mall. One of my photographer friends had set up his tripod and began taking a long exposure of the morgue as the rest of us waited and jokingly tried to convince him to climb inside of it. As this was taking place, 
I happened to look back down the hall from where we came. I couldn't make out any details of the hallway except for the beam of light at the other end. It looked like there was something partially blocking the beam of light coming in from the broken window. Kind of like a shadow, but more like a silhouette, where a person's upper torso and head would have been illuminated by the light, instead of just darkness. However, the second I noticed it, it moved, and the beam of light was undisturbed once again. Right around that time, my fight or flight instinct kicked in, and my bowels went a little loose at the sound of footsteps that came clearly from behind the doors of the unexplored room ahead of us. I can't remember if I screamed, cried, or a little bit of both, but we left there pretty quickly after that. When I was nine years old, my dog died of old age. She was a 14-year-old German Shepherd, and she had been on her way out for a while. Her name was Holly, and she loved to hang out with my dad in his room. She was relatively small for her breed, but she was still very playful. When I was 11, I woke up to hear a dog panting in my front yard. It was dead silent in the middle of summer, and I looked outside to see a German Shepherd standing out my dad's window. How funny, I thought, just like Holly. I go outside to see the dog and it's almost overjoyed to see me. Very happy dog for meeting it the first time. And this dog felt the same way about my whole family. This must just be a coincidence though. I'm curious as to why it chose our house to walk up to at 7 a.m. though. And we contact the owner of the dog and he starts making his way to our house to pick up his dog. Here's where it gets creepy. This dude lived far away. He told us that his dog had run away a few nights ago, but he didn't think she'd come that far. It was only a few towns away, but that's still quite a distance for a dog to travel. We asked the owner what the dog's name was. Holly. We started laughing. We told him we had a German Shepherd called Holly. When we asked her age, they told us she was two, and she was born right after our dog died. We're baffled at this point, so we tell him the story. Everyone seems to think the whole scenario was a big coincidence, and that it was really funny that it happened. But I always wonder if Holly came back after that day in order to hang out with us one last time, or if it was just some dumb, lost dog. I worked in a really old movie theatre for my first job. It was a small theatre with six screens and all in a line, so you could see from one end of the building to the other. Eventually, I got promoted to a manager, so I had to start the movies. We had films still, so it was fairly complicated. You had to thread the projector and then watch over them because they mess up easily. We always joked about ghosts and a lot of weird stuff happening around there, like falling over, doors shutting and hearing voices. Well, one day I was there with one employee, slow midweek day, and I walked out of the office up to the projection booth and out of habit looked both ways. You know, the old left, right, to my right, there was a woman in a whitish dress with brown hair, about four feet away, just standing. I only caught a glimpse of her before doing a double take, and she was gone. I wasn't the only person to see her. Several other employees claimed they've seen a similar woman around the theater. I never saw her again, though. More silly stuff happened like doors locking behind you, or things that were on tables ending up on the floor. Our projectors were old film projectors, and more than a few times one of us would forget to start a movie on time, only to find it had been already started for us. Another manager claimed 
that she saw the ghost woman, who was called Sarah, in the window upstairs when she was leaving for the night. One time we were watching a movie after hours, and we heard a series of what sounded like tin cans fall in succession around the theatre walls. There were some rumours that Sarah was a projectionist at an old theatre elsewhere, who somehow ended up buried in its walls, and pieces of the building were used in the construction of ours, but we never found any evidence to back up this urban legend. I like to be impulsive at night, and I don't mean break into buildings impulsive, though I have been there too. This time it was just to go for a long drive, clear the thought kind of situation. Me and a friend hopped into her car and drove out of town in an effort to end up in the middle of nowhere which isn't hard living here in Australia, as most of our landmass is just forest land and desert once you leave civilization. So plenty of space to find yourself lost in. We kind of expected to get lost part way through the drive, of course. That's half the fun. What we didn't expect was after driving through Cali North, we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere on a road caged on the sides by snow white trees that often looked to be glowing in what was extremely low moonlight. I noticed that we left Cali North at like eight at night, sending out texts to loved ones on my friend's phone for her. We were getting somewhat crap signal the entire drive, but it hadn't dropped out yet. And when we hit these white trees, the signal dies. Messages are now unable to send, even Spotify perishes, despite the fact we downloaded the songs onto the phone. And suddenly the road begins looping in perpetual S-bends that we couldn't shake. Generally, I follow a rule of driving at night. That is, if weird stuff starts to happen, you don't just turn around in the middle of nowhere. So I tell my friend to look for a driveway or some kind of invitation to turn around rather than doing a U-turn right there and then. While in this looping S-Bend drive, we see a sign in the trees. I think I saw it at least eight times over. Who knows how many? I couldn't count. The sign was old and mostly rotted away, carved out to say, Touchwood. And now looking for it, I can't find any sign of a road or place called Touchwood at all. We eventually do find a spot to turn around, not far from the sign. It actually looked like it appeared from nowhere, considering we'd been apparently looping for about a half hour now. After turning around, we manage to get out of there, head back to Cali North, and our signal returns. Thank goodness. Everything comes back on our phones. Signal, Spotify, the works. And we find out that a half hour spent in the loop was apparently four hours. It's past midnight by the time we even return to our town. Both of us are weirded out and somewhat excited at the same time. But like, I've spent over half my morning looking at satellite images of the region, scouring Facebook groups of the area and such, looking for this Touchwood place. And the road we were on doesn't seem to exist. Nothing about the trip was normal. The S-Bend looping roads that never stopped, and the sign repeating itself every few bends. And, of course, the four hours of lost time. Unsure if we drove into a pocket dimension or something, but we were very much freaked out. My cousin told me this story a few years ago. He was insisting I never tell anyone because they would think he's crazy. My cousin Jesse lives in Mexico. He comes over sometimes and he always has another cousin called Johnny who works with a small flower delivery company. It was Friday around 6 p.m. Jesse and Johnny were hanging out together playing games when Johnny's cell phone rings. It was his boss from the flower delivery company 
Apparently they had received a late order and they needed Johnny to deliver. Johnny told Jesse if he wanted to go with him and Jesse agreed. They arrived picking up the flowers and a paper with the address so they knew where to deliver the flowers to. It's a small town about 25 miles from Johnny's house. When they arrived to the address, there's no one in sight. It started getting a little dark. So they decided to cruise around the small abandoned town, and then check out the house again to see if maybe the people had arrived home. They arrived back to the addresses and still nothing, no lights whatsoever. The only lights they had were the car headlights. Across the street, there was a man who appeared to just be stood in darkness. The only part the lights would reveal was his waist and nothing else. Johnny asked the man if he knew the owners and what time they'd be back. The man told them the owners would be back in any minute, but not once did he step into the light. Johnny then told the man if he would leave the flowers in his care and when the owner arrives, if he could give them to them. The man gladly accepted. As the man approached the car, Jesse said something made both of them look down at the man's feet. He said that at that moment he was filled with terror. As where the man's feet were supposed to be were large black hairy hooves. As the man reached out, they noticed the same with his hands. Jesse quickly told Johnny they needed to leave now. Johnny threw the flowers at the man. They got into the car and sped off. Jesse said as they got into the car, the man or thing was still talking about payment for the flowers, but they ignored him as they didn't want to be there a second longer. After that, they arrived at a gas station and brought some drinks and cigarettes as they needed to calm down from the scare they just had. They kept questioning each other on what they saw, but they couldn't believe it. Once they arrived back to the flower place, they told their boss they had been robbed since the flowers were expensive and no one would believe what really happened. A few days later, Johnny went around asking about the place and people would say the town belonged to the devil himself. Today, Johnny doesn't work there anymore. And Jesse says he still has nightmares about the incident. I actually believe him since my family has seen so many encounters with the paranormal. We arrived at a Canadian roadside camping ground in BC. When we got there around 10 PM, it was full of people, big trailers, big four wheel drive cars, some RVs, the whole list of usual suspects. Nobody seemed to really know each other. It was just people like us traveling through. We had a long ride behind us, pitched our tent and went to sleep. We set an alarm for early the next day to maybe catch some early wildlife and get on the road before everyone else. The alarm was set at 5 AM. When we woke up, the entire campground was empty, not a trace of anyone, no trash anywhere. But then again, it is Canada. And when the park ranger came around to collect the overnight fee, we asked him what was going on. He looked at us like we were seeing ghosts. He didn't see anyone except us. They might have left the campground before we did all quiet like, but we're both light sleepers and that's unlikely. To this day, we can't explain what happened.